Hi there. Welcome to another episode of But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast. My name is Bert Scholl. I'm a two-time cancer survivor, a cancer survivorship guide and coach, and I'm the creator and host of But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast. To learn more about my services or about the podcast, please go to BertScholl.com. That's B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-L-L.com. We'd also really love your feedback, which you can provide by going to the BertScholl.com contact page and filling out the form. Please do. And follow us on Instagram and Facebook at But Seriously The Cancer Podcast and on Twitter at But Seriously TCP. And make sure you check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash But Seriously The Cancer Podcast. And thank you so much for all you do. Hey, Marielle, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, good, good. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really fun how we met, right? So whoever one is listening, uh, try, what was it for? Was it the Ally to Ally thing? No, it was for the buddy. Well, you call a talk to talk about the Ally to Ally, but I recruited you for the buddy program after you the shared your story program. with yeah, me. And now I have a buddy who yes, I just you love do. this guy. He's so great. And he thinks the world of you. He's like, my buddy is so awesome. And I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> And so that's right. That's right. We were talking about me being a buddy to someone currently who has cancer, and mm-hmm. then you and I started talking about our stories, yes, and our experiences, yes. And I'm like, holy cow, a kindred spirit when it comes to like the cancer experience, yes. And it was so great talking to you. I'm like, wait a second, you interested in having this conversation recorded? <laughs> 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 and you said yes. Absolutely. Uh, You know, the more that you can help someone, it's kind of crazy when you connect with somebody over cancer, something that is like so devastating and unfortunate. But the fact that, you know, your spin of it is to help others and kind of make a message out of the mess that you've been been given, I think it's pretty awesome for sure. Yeah. And for all of you working (laughs) for the Colon Cancer Alliance, I mean, like, you know, making work yes out of this yes. experience because if they could hire people who might be really good at aspects of the job but not knowing what it's like to have gone through a cancer diagnosis like as you know and so many of you who are listening right now if you've had a cancer diagnosis there's a way you can relate to a person especially when you're undergoing treatment or like you know once once you've been diagnosed you know you can relate with the person mm-hmm. uh, in such a way you can't with someone who hasn't had cancer. Like you might not even be talking about cancer. You could be just watching a ball game or going for a walk and listening to the birds sing, or looking at the river, you know, but it's, you just, you know that they get you in a way yeah. that other people can't. And then, you know, like the loved ones are like, well, you can't, I, 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 well, try to talk, Bert. You can't get me that way. Like, it's like, um, I don't want to get you that way. Like, <laughs> So Be true. grateful that we can't connect like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But it's very true, though. I mean, I think it's wonderful when you're able to connect with somebody. But when it happens organically, it's just amazing. Yeah. And since you and I met through the Colon Cancer Alliance, will you please tell everyone about the Colon Cancer Alliance and what you do? Absolutely. So we help provide um, through our three pillars of screen care and cure. We provide um, screening prevention and access to screening to patients throughout the country. We also provide um, patient navigation services along with financial assistance and resource assistance to patients currently Um, that are newly diagnosed in active treatment or towards the end of treatment and entering survivorship. And we do this through our various programs, such as our peer-to-peer support program, which is um, the Buddy program, which I'm a manager of, which is how we met. Um, We have um, a community engagement program. We have a Never Too Young um, program for those uh, caregivers and patients that have been diagnosed under the age of 50. And then we have Blue Hope Nation, which is our 11,000 member private Facebook group. And then through our cure program, we fund research to hopefully find a cure for the end, to end colorectal cancer within our lifetime. Um, 
So we provide, you know, um, services across every gamut from prevention to hopefully curing this, which I hope we do. I don't want to be unemployed one day, but if that's the goal, (laughs) if that is the goal of what we do, I will happily, you know, accept it with open arms. You'd have no job. I'd have no podcast. Wouldn't we be so sad? I, yes, but so happy at the same time. Like, this is amazing. We'll figure something out. I have a feeling along the way. I'm being silly as can be. I would love to have no podcast. You know what I mean? For this podcast, like, well, no one needs to listen to this podcast ever again. I know. Could you imagine filling out your unemployment request? It's like, how do you not have a job? It's like, we find a cure for colorectal cancer. (laughs) I'm like, please, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and so... It's incredible what you all do. That's quite Thank a, you. That's quite a Thank list. You. you provide screening. Yes, Can we you do. Can say more about that? Because yes. I have, I'm curious about it because you say talking about a cure and the screening brings my mind to one of the conversations I had with Carol Motika, who you and I mentioned previously. Mm-hmm. She's been a guest on a previous episode. And, you know, her telling me about like these uh, genetic tests that are happening. Yeah. Like they're really getting down to like some incredible yeah. science with testing. And it just makes me think like, huh, I wonder when like pre-screening is going to like keep a person from even being diagnosed. They go, here it comes. It's going to start, you know, yeah. so let's do it. You know what I mean? Tell me yeah. about the screening you do. So we have various screening programs that we do. The main one um, is our colonoscopy screening program. And we know that there is a huge void um, in a lot of communities, but also, as you know probably firsthand, if you are not at that age to where your insurance is going to cover the gold standard colonoscopy screening for colorectal cancer, you're going to end up forking out anywhere between 1200 and like 2500 bucks, depending on where, yeah, depending on where you live in the country. So we developed a program that's been around for a few years at the Alliance that patients that are uninsured or underinsured can give us a call. And if they meet the criteria for it, they can qualify for almost a free colonoscopy. And what I mean by almost free is like the main out of pocket that they have to pay is a $25 copay. Um, and yeah, and it, we have facilities throughout the country. We um, partner with a national company that um, has contracted like actual legit GIs and providers throughout the country where they will give patients um, a colonoscopy through us and they will be able, you know, they'll take out any biopsies that they need at that time. If they find any polyps and they're able to remove them at that time, they will do so. They will cover their anesthesia costs. They will send off everything for biopsies. And if, you know, if unfortunately they do end up coming back with a positive screening, then, you know, um, a navigator from the Alliance will be assigned to them and they will help them navigate their disease from beginning to end. Yeah. Does the phone ever stop ringing? It does not, actually. Um, Even when we end at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the phone rings all night long, and we end up, you know, returning the calls first thing in the morning, but it's pretty steady all day long. There are so many un- and underinsured people. Yes, yes. And, you know, a lot of people don't really understand what underinsured is. Like, I am underinsured. Um... Just because I've had colorectal cancer, you would imagine that um, my insurance would end up covering my colonoscopy, but that's not the case. Just because I'm a survivor, I still have to pay for my colonoscopy every year. So that makes me underinsured because my deductible is so high that if I can't pay my, I mean, I can't pay my deduct. I mean, I can because I'm fortunate that I have a job, but for those that can't fork out fifteen hundred dollars for a necessary screening, that becomes a huge problem. Yeah, now I don't want to ask this question, but everyone who's listening is going to be wondering, like, you work for the Colon Cancer Alliance, they don't provide insurance that uh, covers that? They do, but unfortunately, you know, they don't um, manage the bylaws of the insurance company. I wish they did. You know, if Michael Sapienza could have that magic stick to get everybody to free colonoscopy through our program, just... That would be great, but um, it's actually the insurance companies that hold 
majority of the power as to what all they will cover and won't cover. So um, which I think it's unfortunate, to be quite honest. So the insurance plan mm -hmm. that Colon Cancer Alliance has negotiated with the insurance company, the best they can get for the size of their organization is what you have. It's and just nationally. I, it's not just like the alliance. Like it's nationally. Like my husband had a colonoscopy. Um, he's seven years older than me and they found polyps and the insurance is still making him pay a copay to get his follow-up screening. Uh, and now, how, however, now I've been holding on to having him get his colonoscopy because the guideline, they drop the age to 45. So yeah. um, I've been waiting for it to actually go through. And finally it did. So like he's like five months. I'm like the token trophy wife right now. <laughs> I'm like, I waited the five months. <laughs> Pass his due date for his colonoscopy because I didn't want to pay all that money if I knew that the insurance was going to cover it. So, I mean, thankfully, though, I hope and pray that there's nothing wrong with him and we'll have the same success as last time. But it's not um, on the alliance fault. It's literally with the insurance company. That's why I'm like, I really do wish that, you know, Michael could say, hey, my staff with the colorectal cancer alliance, we need them to have all this taken care of. But Unfortunately, that's not how it works. It'd be nice. Hmm. But I guess I just don't know that much about insurance. I know. They're I wonderful, know. aren't they? They're so great. And I had so. my first colonoscopy when this <laughs> all started. Yeah. I don't, gosh, that was too long ago, 2007. I don't remember what my copay was. Yeah, Regardless. It's, it's crazy. Now I have, I mean, I have a great insurance plan through the Alliance. Um, and I'm very fortunate that they provide us with certain plans that I picked like the Mac daddy one that it's like no copay, no whatever, because I don't feel like paying for colonoscopies. I don't want to pay for scans. So I pay for the no deductible plan. Um, so I'm thankful and blessed that, you know, the Alliance provides me with that option of coverage. Um, so I thought you said you were under insured that. and you have to pay a copay on that. Well, not if you have a certain package. Like my insurance rent is five hundred dollars a month. Oh, you. So that I don't have a copay. But you said you were underinsured. I am underinsured. If I were to have like a regular Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance plan, they won't cover it. I literally have to pay like five hundred dollars a month to have an insurance plan that will cover my colonoscopy. Okay, you're underinsured and you're paying to not to be under, not be to underinsured. You want okay? Yeah. Does I that make sense? Yeah. This, yeah. Does that make sense? Sorry, it's a little confusing. Yeah. No, but I literally I have yeah. Yeah. This podcast is not called uh, um, insurance. <laughs> <laughs> how to find the best insurance policy because yeah. I would be the worst person to listen to. I yeah. <laughs> know nothing I know. about it, but I get what you're saying. It's uh, yeah. there are costs yeah. for colonoscopies and uh, scans of all kinds mm -hmm. that we have to pay a ton for or can't even get. Right. I still have to have my, you know, for my annual CT scan, my doctor has to send in a request for pre-approval for my insurance company. The mm -hmm. fact that I've had cancer twice, stage two and stage four, apparently that's not a legitimate, uh, you know, that, apparently that's not enough. Right. They also need uh, my doctor to say he had stage two and stage four. And they go, oh, great. Well, then let's get, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get it. And, uh, you know, I honestly, I can't, what am I trying yeah. to say? But you know what is so it. crazy? Like, this whole insurance thing, it's like, it blows my mind. I just turned 40 two months ago, and um, I had to get a mammogram. Lo and behold, preventative, like, it got covered by my insurance. And I was like, really? Like, and you know, I think you'll hear almost every colorectal cancer patient say this. Like, prioritizing butts as much as they emphasize on breast and all that good stuff. I think that would be a good move on their part. You know, um, why can't I get a free colonoscopy covered at 40? Like, you know, 45 right now is not even enough. So I, I look forward to the day where a lot of these um, 
guidelines and criteria change, um, I think it's rather crazy. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand <laughs> how insurance works. All I know is that you know, they're going to provide scans for things that are going to save them money. If they're right. scanning you, it's down to the dollar, right? And if I had a magic wand, what I would do is I would have insurance be available for people mm -hmm. who want to be proactive about their health and wellness and be available for everyone. Now there's yep. a whole conversation. Well, how does that work with a nation of blah, blah, blah? I have no idea. All I said, if I had a magic wand, people could get the scans they needed and not have to decide if they want their mortgage payments to be late or if they're going to get that scan. I yeah. don't know how it works. I don't understand the finances. All I have is just a big heart that says, like, oh, my yeah. gosh, can you imagine? Yeah. Can you imagine? And honestly, like, truly being placed in that predicament where what do you prioritize, you know, being alive to pay that mortgage or paying the mortgage and being super duper sick and not being able to pay it because if they would have given you that scan that you needed majority of all the health problems could have been avoided or prevented or caught earlier. I mean, but yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And then that's if we can get people to get a scan, to get a colonoscopy. Right. Or even just mine. basic screening. I mean. Right. But I know folks, they don't want to go in because they don't want to find out that there's something wrong. Yeah. You know, there's all that concern. People don't want the test because what if they get, what if they get bad news? And you know, if, uh, a buddy of mine <clears throat> used to make this joke. He goes, "You can't get cancer if you don't go to the doctor." But that ha ha ha, that funny joke is expressing something very real. Yeah. People don't want terrible news. Life is hard enough, and it I doesn't know. make sense to avoid it. But human beings don't make, <coughs> excuse me, I can talk for <coughs> 17 hours straight on an airplane next to somebody. But as soon as I start podcasting, my voice goes, oh, let's like not work for a while. Starting over. You know, human beings, we don't make sense. We're emotionally driven. And I agree with that. Life is hard. Yeah. And so, you know, it's got a couple things going on, right? You got trying to get people to get screened and then you have the insurance and the coverage and the cost of doing it. Yeah. So you folks are doing some amazing work. Thank you. It's really I mean, wonderful. Yeah. And right now we have been very fortunate. Like I've been with the Alliance for three years. I still feel like I'm living in March. So and <laughs> March is like literally our craziest, busiest month at the Alliance, as you can imagine, with it being colorectal cancer awareness month. We were very, so it's so like heavy education, providing services that month that literally when March 31st and April 1st roll around and we take a deep breath, it's like, oh my gosh, look at all that we've accomplished. Well, this year has been slightly different, but in a great way. We were able to receive so many like screening partnerships through various companies like Black Health has um, provided us um, over 200 colonoscopies for African-Americans. And as you know, they, are, they have a huge disparity in the colorectal cancer world. They have a very higher risk of diagnosis and death by colorectal cancer. Why is that? Um, so a lot of um, disparities, even within their own communities, access, um, lack of access to appropriate care, lack of access to screening, um, a lot of education that is culturally based. And for example, we have right now like a fit test, like the at-home stool test campaign where we're able to provide patients with this at-home test because, you know, culturally or not, a lot of people have a phobia of a colonoscopy. You know, they feel that it's very invasive and they just mm -hmm. don't want, that's like their last resort. And we've been able to, um, hear a lot about this through this campaign on our helpline because by talking to these patients, it's like, you know, you're over the age of screening, you know, is there a reason why? It's like, oh, I don't feel like getting violated at the doctor and having something being, you know, going up my butt. And, you know, while I understand that, trying to break that phobia and that stigma 
it has become a very huge challenge. It's not just only like in the African American community, it's in various communities throughout the country. But um, it's just very sad that patients are not wanting to get screened because a colonoscopy is the oftentimes the only like gold standard, especially like if you're bleeding or you're having like all these crazy changes um, that are noticeable that go along with the symptoms from colorectal cancer. But I'm just, I feel like I'm still in March because a lot of these campaigns are still going and we're still Mm. so, it's like an overwhelming, busy good that I just like, I feel like I am stuck in a hamster wheel in March because it's just bringing patients all this awareness for screening that, you know, hopefully um, it'll be really, really great at the end to look back at all these months and say, this is how many people we served in addition to the normal amounts on previous years. Yeah. 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 I bet. Wow. Now, when you say black communities are at greater risk, are you talking, uh, how do I want to ask this question? Do you mean black people in general or black people in a certain economic uh, place? You get get Uh, what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I would say both for this reason. Granted, there are a lot of underserved black communities. We see it in, you know, in the news every day. We we are very aware, Mm -hmm. and I, I can say I am very aware because this is the environment, you know, and culture that we serve. The environment in which our patients live. I've worked in um, a medical hospital that, you know, um, at a teaching institution, you can't turn patients away even if they don't have funding. So um, I've been front and center with the lack of access that a lot of patients have. Um, In the African-American communities, it is very well seen that they have, um, they have a higher poverty level than other culture that other demographics do um and oftentimes by no fault of theirs it's just how it's been laid out by society however with that said I feel that even an educated African-American person might still have the same stigmas as somebody that does not have access to care if that makes any sense that their education in regards to preventative care it's not um the same as somebody that actually goes to the doctor all the time that has those general follow-ups. You know, it might be something that they haven't been raised with or have not been able to go to like a doctor in their community that they trust or um, that they have the ability to get to or provides even that screening that they don't have to travel very far from their home. Um, just the, ac- the plain access to it. And the USTF, um, the task force, Prior to this change, um, if you were African-American, you were able to start your screening at the age of 45 instead of 50 because it is more prevalent within the African-American um, community um, than it is for any other average risk American. Um, mm. Yeah. The only thing is, though, that after they dropped the age to 45 for everybody else now, they didn't lower it to 40 for the African-American community. They still kept it at 45. So I wonder if they will lower that screening age for them or if they're going to leave it the same for everyone in the coming yeah, months and year. I think that it would progress right. together or de- digr- digress, degress, get yeah. worse. I really appreciate you answering the question because a couple of things come up for me. You know, it's, uh, you know, I know that there's a history of black people being abused by the medical system or being neglected and 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 then across the country in general you know there's there there is racial bias it's uh mm-hmm. it's just so much a part of the culture that i have yeah. you know, had people tell me like yeah i don't feel you know got <sighs> don't feel comfortable yeah. with a white doctor you know or like wonder how they're going to treat me and uh and you know mm-hmm. because why because it's part of their life all the time like what yeah. why is it, what's gonna magically stop happening in the medical world people are gonna stop having their biases or god forbid you know racist uh thinking so it, it helps to hear the explanation you know but also yeah. what you're pointing to 
is, I mean, or may I say, you know, so that addresses like a cultural relationship to the medical world and to screening. Mm -hmm. And then with black people being a higher percentage of lower income, right? then that's also going to affect uh, right. their ability to have access. Yeah. What I hear sometimes is people collapsing black people and poverty and like i'm like there's plenty of black people who are not poor like let's let, let's let's not say let's not have black and poverty be synonymous right right it's, it's not yeah it's not and i hear it in people speaking sometimes and it's coming from a place of compassion because they care and they want to you know but i'm like um you realize what you just said and how do i know they said it because i said it when i wasn't aware of my thinking you know it's like oh i just made the association and you helped kind of pick yeah. that apart, Mariel, that it's, yeah. it's that there, there's multiple, it's a multifaceted yeah. issue. Yeah. And, and I'll even add this in too. So I'm Hispanic or let, oh, I prefer to be called Latina, whatever. So another thing that you will notice and not to take away for the disparities within the black community but also in the Latino community, the cultural gap is very similar to that in the black community in regards to the education and how we talk about our family history, which is oftentimes a very mute point. Like in both of our cultures, we don't like, we are very, I was talking to a lady the other day and I was like, being Dominican like I am, and she was a black lady, we were both laughing like not at our cultures, but in the similarities, because we, if like, we are very like personal, like we talk about things that are very taboo, like in American culture, like you just don't talk about that. But like in the black community and in the, in the Latin community, we're like very boisterous and it's like, everything is game on. But when it comes to talking about like the important things, like your medical family history, any type of symptoms that you're having, like it's very hush hush and null and void. And it's like, how is it that as a culture, we can talk about things that really don't matter when it comes to things like this that are literally life and death. I'm like, we don't talk about it. I'm like, and I think that if we can start changing that part within both of our cultures, we would see hopefully a little push in the needle <laughs> on <Yeah>. um, <laughs> advocating more um, about the importance of, you know, going to a doctor and talking about some of these things that really can be very significant in, you know, the quality of life that you live in a health perspective. Yeah, Lauren Tarpley was a guest on a previous episode and uh, she told me that in her family... She's black. She's African-American. Mm -hmm. And she told me that in her family, like, she didn't, you know, she went to her first, she was diagnosed with cancer. She goes to the doc. Her mom's come with her. Her mom came with her, and the doctor's asking, is there cancer in your family? And her mom's going down the list, and Lauren's like, what? <laughs> I didn't know all these people in our family had cancer. And her mom's like, you know, because they don't talk about it. Yeah. And I was like, what? I mean, I have yeah. a, my father was Russian, and uh, he, is, he was first generation uh, born in the U.S., Russian, and he did not talk about family much at all. Mm, yeah. <laughs> like, the, the hell with, like, medical stuff. He didn't, you know, it's just like, there's so much I didn't know because my dad was like, you know, it was considered, uh, his, you know, my dad was a lot older. He was like 50 when I was born. Mm. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, he came from a place and a time, you know, a culture where, you know, it was like inappropriate to be talking about yourself, mm -hmm. to be talking about your family. And I've met other Russian people who are like, you know, I had a neighbor and she's first generation Russian here living in the U.S. She said she'd ask her grandmother, like, you know, what was it like living in Russia when you were uh, you know, my age? She was always very cold. She was right, <laughs> Grandma. Like, you know, what was it like when it was so difficult? Like emotionally, what was it like? She was oh. It's a very cold, very difficult time. You know, not a word. They won't say anything. No. That doesn't help. <laughs> now, we had a patient, um, Anna, that I became really close to. And majority of how we bonded 
was laughing at her own culture. She was Russian. And she would send me like memes and videos. She's like, you can tell that I am not American because this and this would not happen in my house. And we would just laugh at these videos. And then I sent her like videos of like Dominican people like yelling at their kids for A, B, and C. And I'm like, this would never happen in my house. I'm like, this is what it's like growing up with a Dominican mom. She's like, this is why we're no nonsense. We're very blunt and to the point. I'm like, yes, I want you to know what I'm asking you to do and telling you the first time. I was like, there is no like time out. There is no like, come here, let me hold your hand. I'm like, so I love that we're able to have that like cultural banter because honestly, um, the laughs that have gone around it, even talking about like our diagnosis and things like that, um, were definitely great in breaking that ice. I mean, but I wish that, you know, medical family history, going back to our conversation, was something that everyone openly discussed um, because it literally can save more lives than we can imagine. Yes. And, you know, the question is, you know, what is it really, you know, what's behind it? You know, I'm not asking you, but I'm saying, you know, my mind is like, okay, so what does speaking about the medical history of our family members mean, what does speaking about the medical history of my family members mean about me as a person? What taboo am I violating? Where, where am I stepping that we don't step? Because right. really, like, you know, the mind is an incredible tool and it's also a massive pain in the ass. Right, yeah. like it, it, it directs us through, you know, culturally we're taught, you know, we don't do this. And it's, it's all unspoken and you learn why we don't do this. I mean, the funny thing about my dad not talking about family in the past, my mom is, uh, you know, was born Irish Catholic and she's just, it's just endless talk about the family in the past. They both come from these stoic, like we can handle anything, but thank God yeah. my mom talks about feelings because I'm like Mr. Feelings. Anyone who knows me knows just like, <clears throat> you know, I was the guy when, when I was younger and, you know, you, you know, usually women, women would complain about guys who don't talk about their feelings and <laughs> I'd be complaining about women who don't talk about their feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about our feelings. Come on. But you have to tell me, so what's this cultural, t like you're saying, like, you know, we yeah. don't talk about uh, medical history yeah. and kind of stuff in our culture, but there's things that would be considered taboo that you do talk about. Yeah. So you got to tell me yeah. what those are. I know. Right. And it's like, I think truly it's probably no, because... They? Yeah. And the thing, like, I just, uh, probably for me, my interpretation would be like, we don't talk about our business out in public like that. Like, you know, private things like that stay within our family. And I can definitely understand that. Um, but I mean, come on, man. Like, really? Like, I think it would be important if I knew that somebody in my family, like, I know for a fact, like, my aunt had thyroid cancer. When I was younger, my mom's cousin had breast cancer, early stage, thankfully, but it was still pretty rough. But outside of that, like my grandma's history, medical history, I know because I have lived and witnessed it. My grandfather's as well. My dad's mom, she's in her 90s, lives in the Caribbean. And the running joke in her family, God forgive me, is that she's been dying since I was born. Literally. <laughs> like, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> So, like, you know, there's always that one person in your family that has some type of ailment and they think they're going to die any day now. And they're the ones that end up outliving everybody. That is my <laughs> grandmother. <laughs> like, literally, my mom's like, every time I talk to her, she, I was like, I talked to grandma. She's like my last living grandparent. And she literally is going to be 94 this year. It's insane. And literally, she has had some dying ailment since I was born and I'm 40. <laughs> like, it's... <laughs> And every time oh, I talk to him, and when I call my dad, he's like, let me let you talk to my mom. You know, she's probably going to die one day this week. Any day now, she's going to die. And I am like, she's not going to die. I am like, I'm going to be like 95 and she's still going to be here. She's I am been like, for 30 come years. on out. I'm like, she's never going to die. I'm like, no. So I'll tell you what's, I'll tell you what's pretty taboo, you know, uh, getting rectal cancer and having to talk about my rectum. Oh, I know, and, right? And having having a colostomy permanently, and I'm at the lake just the other day. It was gorgeous out, and I'm sitting out there getting some sun. I take my shirt off, and, you know, there's my pouch. And uh, 
you know we uh we don't nobody talks about uh gas and bowel movements unless it's no. a joke unless it's a Absolutely. joke or they're yeah. like it's you know i mean i mean among you know not in the medical thing but like just you know nobody, right. nobody talks about that and like oh great yeah. i gotta talk about colon cancer colorectal cancer now we're talking about where i poop and all this stuff and yeah. like, now we got to talk about this i know is that, and you is that taboo <laughs> Absolutely. And you have such a valid point because nobody really wants to talk about it. But, you know, you like these companies don't have a problem with making Play-Doh poop like and sell it. Have you seen that? Like a Walmart Target in the Play-Doh section? They have like they have like a mold with brown Play-Doh that you can like put in there and it looks like an actual turd, like legit. I am like, who comes up with Good. this concept? Like, nobody really, like, nobody wants to talk about rectal cancer without throwing shame at whoever has been diagnosed. Like, what did you do? And somebody did that to my friend. Like, I've talked to her about this. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, why? Like, people literally made her feel bad about having rectal cancer. And personally speaking, I feel as though rectal cancer patients have a lot more bias thrown at them than a colon cancer patient like myself why what are people i think because we... with i i think is people's like misconceptions truly like anatomy wise they look more towards your rectum as like what were you doing with your butt like they i think they ah. relate more like the rectum with like the actual like poop and the anus and all that they don't understand that the anus is totally like on the bottom of like the rectums up here the anus is down here so it's like what did you do to get rectal cancer are you having like anal sex like are you doing this are you doing that and i'm like dude really like aside from god forbid someone have anal sex like (laughs) but honestly like i my girlfriend with i mean i never had these questions thankfully nobody ever asked me like what did i do to get colon cancer I wish I knew what I did to get colon cancer because I can save so many people and tell them not to do it (laughs) if it's something similar in our story. Um, Could you imagine if I were to meet you and was like, so did you know that um, I ate five boxes of cornflakes when I was little and that gave me colon cancer? Did you eat cornflakes too? Like what kind of pickup line would that be? You know, (laughs) could you imagine like sitting at like your oncology clinic like so? what did you do to get here today? Like, tell me your story. I'll tell you mine. Like, come on, man. Right. But, oh my gosh. And yeah. that is, I, I, I feel really bad for, um, people that are kind of judgmental about that. Um, and also I can see why many people don't really share their story just for the sake of not being judged like that. Now I'm fascinated with the human mind. I always have been. I wonder if people, try to find a way to blame you for your cancer that way they can continue to believe that they're not at risk make a valid point there death is pretty taboo in this country how about that Absolutely. i saw um what was it like will smith narrates this really cool uh series is it called like uh it's about the earth Uh uh-huh it's a really cool series, and uh, I think this is the one where they show how this group of people, they like every year they pull the deceased people out of their caskets and stand with them and take pictures with them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And put like cigarette. One guy put a cigarette in, his, uh, in his, you know, his, his dad's mouth, his deceased, whoever the person was, you know what I mean? Yeah, and every year they get to, they, 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 they Exhum is that the word? Yeah. You know they, they they pull out the casket, and they and they stand it up and they take photos with the dead. Wow. American people hate talking about death. Why would you go and get cancer screened? Because you don't. People don't want to talk about death. People don't want to talk about dying. I once I got diagnosed, I kept death very close to my heart because it reminds me that life is precious. Absolutely. And tomorrow's promise to no one. And that's one of the most wonderful things that happened to me as a result of being diagnosed. You know, it's uh, we don't like talking about death. Nobody wants to, you know, why you got to talk about that? Yeah. Why you got to bring everybody down? It's like death yeah. 
death gets me excited. Death gets me jumping, and I'm asleep. really. Yeah, oh, I love talking about death. There's I used to go to um these things called uh, death cafes, where you'd sit down what? with a group of people and talk about death. Wow, that's fascinating to me. Well, I I think death doesn't scare me because I worked in hospice. I love hospice. Like I, if it's done right, like I am a huge advocate for hospice care. And end of life management. Um, I wondered if that's something where I should go contribute my time because I'm like, doesn't make me uncomfortable. <laughs> no, I mean, and literally, like, I love talking about hospice. Like, I, I mean, I lived in that arena for three years prior to coming, literally coming to the Alliance. That's where I worked in when I was diagnosed, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of funny. I'll tell you more about that when we um, dive into my diagnosis story. But um, it's really, you know, in that perspective, like I don't mind talking about death. I literally, you know, in those dark days during your um, journey that you really feel like you are on such a low that you feel like you're dying. Like I literally, I became upset. Like I would have like daydreams as to how I was going to die. Mm-hmm. And then I got really sad and that sounds really crazy and morbid and really dark. But you and I've had discussions like processing those really dark moments, I think kind of makes us get through those bad days of the diagnosis. It's like, what am I doing? Kind of like snap out of it. Like this is really, you know, it's what you make of it at the end of the day. But I, I made like my five wishes without telling my husband. Like I literally went in my social worker's closet one day at work And I pulled the five wishes that we put in our admissions packets for our patients and their families of, you know, in the case of imminent death, like what it, what is it that you want? Hmm. Like, you know, like who's going to make those final decisions? I'm like, I put my sister, Alex, so I'm one of four girls and my sister, Alex has been my ride or die since we were, we're like 18 months apart. So I literally put her and my husband to pull the plug on me, like if I ever became a vegetable during the situation, because I know that they would not keep me alive for their own selfish reasons. I'm like, who literally is going to pull the plug on me and not leave me hook up to a machine just for their own sake? And nobody knew about this except for my mom. Like I sat my mom down one night. I think I was like on treatment number seven. And I was like, I, um, before I go in tomorrow, I want to talk to you about something. And I like, I lost it. Like I didn't cry. Like, I hadn't cried to anybody during, since I was diagnosed. And I was like, if anything happens to me, I'm like, this is what I want to happen to me. My, and every time I read over one section, my mom would like become hysterical. And she's like, thanks for telling me, but we're not going to need that. And then I moved on to the next section. And she's like, I don't agree with that, but I don't think your sister would do that. I was like, yes, she would, because she knows that I will haunt her until she dies. And I was like, and then we'll fight. <laughs> But we don't want to um, talk about that. Nobody wants to. I mean, yeah. in, in my heart, because no parent wants to talk to their child about the possibility of them dying. And the reality is, parents bury their adult children. They bury their young children. It's heartbreaking every time. Mm-hmm. We have mm-hmm. it culturally that you're supposed to bury your parent, not them bury yeah. you. Mm-hmm. We would love that. And if you look at human existence on the planet, that's not always how it goes. Right. Right. And, and that, you know. Okay. God. No, it's like, and that became a very big reality for my mom, especially like when I went into anaphylactic shock, like really bad um, on one of my treatments, like my mom literally, she's like, I'm not prepared to like bury you. And then it happened again and I was in front of her and she was like, I am not doing this. Like it was, it was intense for a for a short while. Mm. Yeah. I bet yeah. it was. But I, I just <laughs> want to step back and say as far as daydreaming about death. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine navigating a cancer diagnosis and not daydreaming about that. I know. Like, I would even get into it. I'd be like, wow, if I'm going to die, I'm going to do, I'm going to be a badass. Yeah, like, I'm I'm going to go out on my terms. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to give, I'm going to share this experience with the world. I'm like, the day I read the book Tuesdays with Maury, you know that book? Yes, I went and got it after I talked to you. Oh, did we talk about, okay, yeah. I was like, Okay, Maury, thank you. What, if, should I be so, 
should I be so lucky, right? Well, people right. are like, oh, you're not lucky, you're dying. Well, guess what? We're all dying. So should yeah. I be so lucky that when I die, I have the opportunity to share it? Yeah. Share my experience absolutely. with the world? I will. So you read it? I did. And, you know, I think for us to be, you and I, to be given the opportunity to do what we do after our cancer diagnosis, like you with your podcast and being able to help this buddy and myself to have ended at the Alliance after my bout with colorectal cancer and that I'm able to help others through their journey and in survivorship. I think it's an absolute blessing in disguise because of how we got here probably would not have happened if we were like normal, healthy individuals. Oh my goodness. By far. When my <laughs> friend, before I was diagnosed, I had a friend who was diagnosed. We were in a coaching program. She was my coach training me. It was a six month rigorous program. She gets diagnosed with cancer. I'm there for her. I'm her friend. I'm supportive. She had to leave the program because treatment got too intense. What did I do? I did not call her. I f just blanked out, had no idea. <clears throat> she calls me. And she called a list of people. And I was on that list. Like, hey, Bert, I've got cancer. Where are you? I burst into tears. I was like, uh, I'm being terrified. I thought you were going to die. And I freaked out. And I didn't know what to say when I called you. So I did nothing. She's like, well, I'm not dead. And we're talking right now. <coughs> God, excuse me. <coughs> then I'm going to go pee in a second. <coughs> And then we started talking, and I burst into tears, and we got together. I was not wired to speak about cancer with anybody, and it mm -hmm. scared the hell out of me, and I ran right. the other way. And I get diagnosed, and I go, oh, nothing changes. You still make ridiculous jokes and inappropriate comments about you know life, and but now my life includes cancer, so I'm making inappropriate and ludicrous comments about this. It's like... The only thing that changed is like, well, a lot has changed, but you're still yourself. You're still, you know, you, you, you have different ups and downs, but like, you know, what do you say when your friend has cancer and you don't right. know what to say? Hey, what's up, yeah. Marielle? It's Bert. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm freaked out. I don't know what to say to you. Like you got cancer and I love you and I don't know what the hell to say and I don't want to say the wrong thing to you. Mm hmm How about just Great. be my friend? <laughs> Pardon? How about just be my friend? Right, like, and, but it's like it's like, it, that's real though. It's like you know, if you don't know what to say, it say is. That. It's so, I know it's so real, and you know, like I. All right, let me ask you this. So when you were when you were told you had cancer and you made your like you made your diagnosis public, did you have this like? kind of like vomit of people that have like came out of the woodworks that you hadn't talked to in years. And it's like, how can I help? What can I do? I'm so sorry. You're so brave. You're so strong. Da, da, da. And then like, after you beat it, everybody goes away. It's like, mm. you know what I mean? Like, yes. Yeah, so I definitely noticed a shift. Like people, people were like, Oh, you're better now. <laughs> I'm like, and sorry, I'm not dead. <laughs> say pardon like what do you and it's like oh you're better now you're like yeah like i'm sorry that i am not like is it disappointing in a way <laughs> but i don't think people recognize that when you've spent x number of months or years under treatment so you don't die once the treatment's over and life is quote back to normal and you can go back to work. For most of us, what's very present is everything that was brought up as a result of nearly dying. There's so much about ourselves that has changed. There's so many things that are uncertain. Uh, I've been discovering myself, rediscovering myself since the first time I recovered in 2009. 
I was told I was cancer free. And I was diagnosed again in 2011. It has woken up so much in me that I'm grateful for. But the most lost I was in life was when I was told I was cancer free. I agree 100%. All the care ended. All the, you know, weekly interactions with all the medical people, like, you know, having a team of people making sure that I'm cared for, having community and family showing up and bringing food, checking in, it all stops, comes to a screeching halt. And then here's me with all of my lifetime of baggage that's been like dumped into my lap, family things that come up. So yeah, to answer your question, that silence is profound. That silence is deafening. And no one knows about that. Yeah. You don't know about it as a survivor finishing treatment. You're lucky if one person in your life knows about it. The medical staff that I interacted with, they didn't warn me about it. Mm-mm. I honestly think that survivorship is a lot harder than going through treatment. Mariel, there, when I was cancer-free the second time, my wife had ended our marriage before my second diagnosis, like 10 months prior. I lost her. Two months later, I lost my job. Moved out of the house a few months later and then got diagnosed with stage four rectal cancer. All in 10 months. I went through my treatment like a crazy person. Finished my treatment. And I'm like, oh, you're cancer-free, congratulations. I'm like, oh, wait, now I can grieve the loss of my marriage that I never really got to grieve, and I need to get a job, and I don't know what I'm going to do for money. And I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, if I could just get cancer again, I know what to do. That makes me want to cry. Like, I literally, like, ugh, that's awful. I know how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to navigate life where everything I had is now gone, Mm -hmm. except for my kid and my stepson. Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody's still there, but like the foundation of who I was, how about this? Everything that I thought that mattered to me, almost all of it was gone. Now, my siblings might hear this, be like, um, excuse me, but like, they get what I'm saying. It's like, I lost my wife, my job, my home with her and the kids. And almost died a second time. Mm -hmm. Like, I started realizing what mattered to me. But first I had to realize that I had no idea what mattered to me, Mariel. I didn't have a damn clue. And it was silent. And there was no one out there to be like, you know, except one person. Well, a few people, but really there's one person, uh, when I was, uh, when I got my life coach certification in 2010, I asked my classmates if anybody wanted to practice every week or every couple of weeks. And three people said yes, and one person showed up. Her name is Gloria. And she and I have been coaching each other every other week for the last 10 and a half years. I love that. So, oh man, like to, to think about what she coached me through. Opening up those conversations, untangling that rat's nest of thoughts and trying to get clarity. She provided me so much. And interestingly, I won't share her personal experience, but she went through some profoundly difficult circumstances as well that I was there then to coach her through. Uh, I feel blessed that I had her available to me. I feel blessed that I'd gone through that six-month uh, 
training program that my friend got diagnosed with cancer in. Like, I feel like I had a lot of training available to me prior to being diagnosed so that when I went through it, I had language. I had a language to put to my thinking so at least I could say I have no language for what I'm going through. (laughs) (laughs) Post-treatment-wise... So, yeah, that was what it was like for me. What was your experience of stepping out of treatment and ringing the bell and then silence? That bell traumatized the hell out of me. Really? Oh, my God. So, in the beginning, like, the first few treatments, like, I was okay. I was like, I I got this. Like, it's not that bad. Then I started on Solota. And literally by round two, like, it had kicked my butt. Like, I've endured a lot of, like, medical things in my life. But I am just, like, I literally thought I was dying. All I was doing was sleeping. I lost 25 pounds. Like, Mm. I was just, like, what is happening? Like, my hands were, they looked like hot dogs. They were, my fingers were so swollen. I mean, everything bad that they tell you can happen on chemo they're like but don't worry it won't happen to you happened to me like straight off out the gate like straight out of the gate like I thought I was going insane like I yelled and cursed out the on-call doctor one time because I was my hands were in so much pain I'm like how do you put old people through this treatment like if I'm (laughs) having (laughs) I'm like I'm 36 and I'm like kicking my butt like how do you do this to a 70 year old person like how inhuman are you like my mom's like, stop yelling at the doctor. Just ask him for pain meds. She's like, stop yelling at the doctors. <laughs> I need to speak my mind first. What are you talking I, about? Literally, I'm like, stop talking, mom. Like, stop. I just need to voice my opinion. And the doctor's laughing. And I'm like, trying not to get mad at him. I'm like, you know, just give him my pain meds and stop doing this to old people. And he's like, oddly enough they handle treatment so much better than you youngins. And I'm like, really? Because that's supposed to make me feel better about my current situation. (laughs) But but, um, I have a a very funny like explanation for survivorship. So, you know, like when you're in treatment, you really want to break up with your oncologist but it's like the most ridiculously abusive relationship you could ever be in (laughs) because like when you start like you meet in this random blind date with your oncologist right it's like you've never met them you show up and you're like hi I'm Bert hey I'm Marielle I'm here nice to meet you and you're like chipper you come nicely dressed for your first meeting you're like yay you know great first impression (laughs) then Then you're like, am and I then they put their, really their finger wanting? up your butt, and you're like, um. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, well, you know, my job is to cure and clean this up, you know, make sure you live, and you're gonna love me. At the end of this, you're really gonna like me. I'm like, yeah, we'll see. And you know, like they sweet talk you, and then you go in for your first treatment. You're like, okay, everything's good. You come back for blood work, and they give you a pat in the back, and it's like, here's your hug. At least for the ladies, like here's your hug from your oncologist. It's like you're doing so great. Blah blah blah. They fluff you up and. Off you go. Then you come back for that third, fourth, and fifth date. And then you're like, start having a second thoughts. You're like, why do I like you? And why am I here? Like, this dinner better be fabulous. You know, you order that steak with your little treatment. You go on about your business. And then at the end, you're like, I'm ready to see other people, but not really. And then you're like, <laughs> you get to the end and it's like, okay, fine. I need some space. Um we're going to talk to other people, but I'll let you know when I need you and you can just randomly pop in. And that's when you're done with treatment. Right. And then you're like in this limbo of like, well, are we dating? Are we not dating? Like, when am I going to see you again? They kind of leave you hanging, kind of ghost you for a while. And it's like the breakup that like you kind of anticipate, but yet you punish yourself because you really want that in your life, but not really. That's the toxic relationship that I have with my boyfriend oncologist. I'm like, but then he tried Then he tried to dump me. He's really going to try to dump me in June. And I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know how I feel about this. (laughs) I'm very codependent on my oncologist. I'm like, listen, I'm like, we're going to have to talk about this breakup. But (laughs) with that said. You are blowing me away with this analogy. But it really is like, and honestly, and that's why I think, you know, such a wonderful icebreaker when I talk to these people. On, like these people to our patients and their families on the phone because 
I just keep it real. I am like, listen, I've been where you are. I'm like, and this really is how it is. And just finding humor in it because I was not prepared for survivorship. And the other analogy that I have is like, you know, when, and this sounds really crazy, but it's really true. You know, like when inmates are released from prison, they don't have, like, they don't get rehabbed. Like, all that they know is incarceration and having their day completely, like, scheduled down to every waking second. And they have bedtime and they have this regimen that they are accustomed to. When they are literally set off into their free world, per se, all that structure is completely gone. And they're like, what the hell do I do? You know what I mean? They get back into old habits and things of that nature. Yes. That's how I felt stepping into survivorship because it's like, here's a pat on the back. You lived. We're going to see you every three months for blood work and every six months for scans for the next two years. And then we're going to change it up and then we're going to do this and that. It's not, I'm going to call you and let you know A, B, and C. I'm not going to check in on you and see how you're doing. I'm not going to see you every two weeks. Like the things that you knew that were coming that you have dealt with for six, eight, ten months, however long it takes you to get through treatment. All of that literally at the snap of a finger just goes away. And then you're like, what the hell do I do? But you start processing the things of, okay, well, old Marielle did this. Like, I lost my job during treatment. Let's talk about it in a minute. So it's like, I have no job, right? So in my head, I was like, I'm going to rest and try to get myself, you know, get this chemo out of my body, get myself to where I need to be, and then start looking for work. Because that's what you do. You're not going to be sitting at home for the rest of your life, right? But then it's like, who's going to hire me when I tell them that I just survived cancer? You know, it's like, am I going to be some wild card? Do I disclose this? Do what, like, what do I do? Then you start getting long-term side effects that start popping up that nobody really talked to you about. And they might have mentioned it here and there, but... They really didn't discuss as to what to expect. Like the PTSD of if anything hurts within the first six months doesn't mean that your cancer is back. You know, Mm -hmm. that like I ended up getting really bad back pain. I just, I ended up putting some random muscle and I thought I had like liver emits. Like I literally, Mm -hmm. every time something happened, I freaked out. Um, They don't prepare you for that. So you kind of have to figure it out on your own. And that literally, like the PTSD from a cancer diagnosis is intense. Um, Thankfully for me, I've learned to manage it on my own, but I manage it a lot more by being a source of support for other people. And I compartmentalize my stuff. That's just how I work for myself, which is not very healthy. Um, (laughs) But what you said is you figured it out on your own. Yes, and, and I so think... so many of us do. Right, and I honestly, I feel as though we're very hard on ourselves as survivors because we want to try so hard to be and go back to being the person that we were when we heard you have cancer. But along the way, that person is no longer the same, and we fail to see the transformation because we're so caught up on how we change physically. Like me seeing myself change physically in the mirror as every treatment came and went was very hard on me. Like I lost all my hair by my second round. Mm. By then I had lost 20 pounds by my second round. You know, um, My gums were bleeding all the time. I could barely eat, you know. Um, We can't touch cold things. It was starting to get cold in Charleston when I was going through treatment. Like, I was still working and having to pretend that I was okay because I knew that that was what the requirement was, you know. Um, Being able to still be a mom and pretend that everything is fine. You know, like in doing all those things, I think it's great. I'm not asking for a medal or anything like that. But as humans and as responsible people, that is what we do. Um, But I caught myself in survivorship beating myself up because I was not performing 
to the level that the old Mariel did. And I felt as though it was less of myself because I could not meet my previous goals. Forget the fact that I had cancer and I like fought for my life for 10 months. But because I was so caught up on being back to who I was that I forgot how much I had changed and how stronger I had become through the process that I was completely ignoring all of that. Um, mentally, I, I can't even tell you what happened to me mentally post-treatment. Like the depression and anxiety that came took me by surprise in a way that like I became manic at times to I would go from talking to you just like this to completely crying for no reason and one night all I wanted to do was just leave my house I did I couldn't tell you where I wanted to go why I wanted to leave what was happening I was just so emotionally overwhelmed that my children started to take it personally. And my oldest daughter, um, my stepdaughter Faith, came up to me and she was hysterically crying. And she's like, Mom, are you leaving because of me? Mom, please don't leave because of me. And I was like, I'm not leaving because she's like, I don't know why I want, like I'm screaming and crying. I was like, I don't know what is wrong with me. I can't put it into words. I do not know what is wrong. And my poor husband, like, caught the blunt end of it. But, like, mentally, it is so hard until you learn how to figure it out. Getting to that point, oh, my God. Like, my heart breaks for anyone that I talk to that is in that predicament. That is just, like, when is it going to end? Yeah, like, your husband oh. receiving the brunt of it? Oh, That's yeah. what we're talking about when we're talking about being there for a spouse. It's like, you know, how many how many caretakers get support how many caretakers are told like you're gonna catch a lot of shit that mm -hmm. isn't about you yeah you know like you it, as i'm listening to you speak it's like you know you got diagnosed oh my gosh i might die mm. and then you discover your own strength and your own power in navigating this and mm -hmm. as difficult as it is you really like and so many of us discover who we're who we are and what we're capable of, and we like it's like wow, I would have never thought I could get through something like this. And then when treatment's over, it's like I developed a confidence going through cancer. I was like, wow, I'm doing this, and I had to be careful with people telling me what an inspiration I was because I didn't want to then not have the space to be a human being who isn't always yeah. going to be powerful. But it had me feel like, wow, like I'm not, I didn't think I could handle this. Like I'm a strong person. I've been through a lot. Mm -hmm. And then it's all over and the bell rings and it's silent. And all this confidence that I had about who I was, and I'm really getting language for this more now is with, with this conversation with you than I've had when I woke up this morning, you know? That power and that strength and that awareness and that confidence, it doesn't seem to fit into the power, strength, confidence, and awareness that is required of me in daily life. I agree. I don't know how to fit it together. I have developed superpowers, and now that treatment's over, I don't know how to use them. True. True. But I had the total opposite effect. Like, I am so self-conscious since treatment. Like, I am everybody's hype man. But when it comes to me, I, I think it's for some of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about later. About, like, what I had to endure through diagnosis. But, like, my self-confidence, like, I think took the biggest toll. Um going because through of, treatment because of the diagnosis and treatment because of losing my job during treatment like it really like for me as a person the trauma of losing my job in the manner in which it happened like it like even now like yes I hear that I'm really great at what I do and that this is a fit for me and I agree with it 100% because I love helping people. Like for me, my diagnosis has always gone above and beyond 
is my diagnosis has never been about me, point blank. Um, from the beginning, it's always been about how I can help others. Mm. Um, yeah. And through the process of everything that I poured into my job and everything that I did in the manner in which I lost my job, like personally, it completely like crushed any type of like self-confidence that I have in myself. And like, I joke around, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so awesome. Like, blah, blah. But I really, I don't, I'm like very humble when it comes to stuff like that. I don't, I'm not like a very boastful kind of person. Like I'll joke around and say certain things, but um, I don't really like, yeah, like it's so crazy. Like it's, it, it's for me, it's really sad because I, I am mad at myself for making my job such a part of my identity that for me to have accomplished so much at a young age that that completely just stopped and I had fought so hard for that I got more upset at the fact that the only thing that cancer took from me was that I think eventually I would have lost it anyway but um I felt like I was contributing in a you know in a great way to my marriage like right now I still like I do okay but um I wish I could do more you know what I mean like I don't know I don't know I don't know how to explain it really, but sounds it, like it, yeah. who you are, <clears throat> excuse me, sounds like how you participate in life is by being a contribution to other people and mm-hmm. you don't focus on yourself. I don't. And so. I've never been like that. <laughs> yeah. So what were you, you were diagnosed with uh, stage three B colon cancer and how mm-hmm. old were you? I was I just turned 36. You were 36 years old. Yeah. And how did you find out you had cancer? By total accident. I might cry. Like, it's okay if I cry. Like, I don't... Cry away. I'll be crying with you. I got tissues right <laughs> well, now. Well, like, I, <laughs> I rarely... I think this is honestly the first time that I've actually ever openly talked about this. Um, so, uh, I was working for a national hospice company, and... I managed two offices, like they were two hours apart. And my medical director happened to be an internist and had a weight management loss clinic. And I was like, hey, by the way, do you think um, I can come see you? I want to lose some weight, but I have some stuff going on. And what I mean, like I had to lose weight, like I could have gone like 30 pounds, mind you. Like I wasn't like ginormous, but so (laughs) she was like, absolutely. So I go and see her and I'm like, you know, I'm having these problems. I'm like, I'm super constipated. Um, It doesn't matter what I take or what I do. Like I've changed my diet. I've eaten really greasy foods. See if I can give myself like diarrhea and nothing happens. Like I'll eat nothing but a bunch of salads for a week. Nothing happens. I'm like, it's like a constant struggle. So she's like, well, let's do this weight management clinic and see if that helps you lose any weight. I'm like, all for it. I'm like, maybe it's something that I'm not doing. So I start the first month, I lose like three pounds. I was like, oh, this is great. Just my birthday present to myself. You know, my mother-in-law always gives us birthday money. So I was like, thanks, Kathy. (laughs) This is what I treated myself to. So um, a month in, work starts getting crazier. I become more stressed. I start bleeding when I go to the bathroom, but not every single time. So I was like, crap. I was like, mom, I think I had hemorrhoids. I was like, I'm bleeding every other time I go to the bathroom, but I'm super constipated. So I think I just tore something. So I tell my, I tell my doctor, my PCP at our next patient staff meeting, I was like, Hey, she's like, how's it going? I was like, not well. It's like, I'm starting to bleed when I go to the bathroom. I'm like, she's like, well, here's some medicine for IBS. Just come by the office when you drop off those um, orders and I'll give you a prescription for it. It's like, all right, cool. So then I go on IBS treatment for a month. My bleeding gets worse. So at that point, that month, I lost 15 pounds. And I was like, hell yeah. I was like, this is working really great. I was like, awesome. I was like, I lost a total of 20 pounds in two months. She's like, yeah, 15 pounds in a month is not normal. I was like... Okay, because I was still, I chose the plan, not just doing shakes. Like, 
I chose the actual learning how to eat normal food because in all of these programs to put you on shakes, but when you're done with the program and you lose weight and you go back to eating normal food, you automatically, boom, put it back on. So I was like, mm-hmm. I'm not stupid. If, like, if I'm going to invest all this money, I'm going to learn how to do it right. So she's like, well, my husband is a GI. Let's just set you up with him and see what he says. So I go to her husband and he ups my IBS medicine and he listens to everything. He's like, well, I'm not going to do a scope right now. You're really young. You just turned 36. You have no family history, blah, 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 blah. So we're going to try this medication. So I call him two weeks in and I'm like, I am still bleeding. My bleeding is getting worse. Like we need to do something about it. He's like, fine, we'll go ahead and schedule a colonoscopy. Come by and pick up this prep that I have for you. I'm like, all right, cool. So this is now the middle of June. My doctor's mom dies of colon cancer. So we're like, ask my office, like we do all these things for her. Like, we're so sorry. Your mom passed, blah, blah, blah. She's like, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Her husband, the GI, diagnosed his wife, his mother-in-law, blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, oh, that sucks. Then I go in for my, the morning of my colonoscopy. My son is five. My daughter was 11. And they're downstairs and I'm chugging the, re- the prep and I'm like walking around. I'm like, oh, yeah. All of a sudden I start like throwing up like nobody's business. My mom cleans when she's stressed out. She's cleaning upstairs. My daughter, my son's like, Mama. Mom is throwing up. Like, you need to come down here. And he's like, oh, she's fine. She's going to be fine. She's not dying. She's good. And I'm like, no, Mom. I'm, like, sweating. You know the soup rep. You're, like, dehydrated. You've been pooping all night. You're, like, so hungry. And I was like, great. I just cancel, Mom. I'm going to just cancel this colonoscopy. I'm like, I'm not going to be clean. Like, I need to cancel it. She's like, no, we're going to go. So off we go. <laughs> the, the nurse puts me in the room, and my blood pressure's through the roof. And she's like, do you have hypertension? I was like, no. I'm like, I'm just really nervous. And she's like, why are you nervous? I was like, I'm scared I'm going to wake up and you're going to tell me I have cancer. Like, mind you, I had already Googled every symptom that I had. Google told me I had cancer. I was like, in my head, I knew. She's like, honey. (laughs) Well, she's like, honey, you're 36. You're too young. She's like, that's never going to happen. Like, no. I'm like, all right. So we go in. I come out and my husband is like a six foot big guy and my mom is like a gray hair version of me and my mom's sitting there crying and I was I'm notorious for seeing things when I come out of anesthesia like odd things from all the surgeries I had like one time my mom told me that I was flirting with the doctor and I was like listen I'm all about having a burger and a beer so like I would love for you to keep me company da, 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 da. <laughs> <Mom is like. laughs> So I'm like, mom, what did I say? And then my nurse is crying. And I was like, did I hurt your feelings? I was like, I am so sorry. Like, what did I do? All of a sudden, the GI walks in and he's like, I have an order for you to get a CT scan here. And he's handing this up to my husband. And he's like, here's an order for a a consult for a colorectal surgeon. Here's an order for an oncologist and some blood work. He's like, "Um, go ahead and schedule the CT MRI as soon as possible. And some nurses will be calling you and walks away. Mind you, I'm his wife's boss, technically. What Just walks off. And I look at my mom, and I'm like, still high on anesthesia. I was like, why do I need an oncologist consult? Like, I don't have cancer. Like, why do I need to go see an oncologist? And I look at the nurse, and she's crying. And I am like, holy. I'm like, do I have cancer? I was like, I don't have cancer. And then I pass out, like, I'm so tired. And I wake back up a couple minutes later, and my mom's crying. And I was like, Mom, I just dreamt my doctor told me I had cancer. Like, do I have to go see an oncologist? She's like, they found a mass in your colon, like, five minutes into your scope. And he sent it off to pathology. I'm like, what? So my husband has a friend that's a GI, mind you. So my husband doesn't say anything. He's normally a quiet guy, but he's like stoic. So uh, I look at my work phone and I have like 27 missed calls from my boss. He supposedly forgot that I hadn't, that I was having a procedure that day. 
So I sent him a text, like, just got on my procedure. Let me get my anesthesia to wear off. I'll catch you up on any updates that you want from the office, but I can't talk to you right now. My mom is in the back seat, and I'm, like, literally, like, 10 times on the way home. I was like, do I really have cancer, Mom? Like, huh? And then finally, right as we were almost getting to my house, like, it dawned on me. And I was like no social media, my girls can't know. I am like, no family except for A, B, and C. I'm like, you need to get on, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm like, you need to get on the phone and call everybody that I want you to tell and you need to shut down their Facebook and everything. I'm like, nobody finds anything out until I get my scans and my girls better not find out from anybody or any phone calls. If not, I will kill them if somebody tells my kids before I do. I literally held my breath for like three days. My husband called, sent pictures, uh, you know, like on your report, they give you pictures, sent pictures of the tumor that they found to his friend that's a GI. And he's like, you know, Mac, I just want you to prepare yourself. He said, that looks like cancer, like your wife has cancer. He's like, how bad it is, I can't tell you, but you you need to prepare her for that. So I go to work the next day like every stupid person does. <laughs> and I am, I'm like in La La Land and I, my PCP, she calls and she's like, Hey, I have your pathology reports. You want to, do you want to talk about it? I was like, I'm on my way. She happened to be like down the street. And I was like, I'm on my way. So it's like, I'm taking lunch guys. I'll be back. I call my husband. I was like, I'm on my way to get my pathology resource. Do you want to go meet like out of Charlie's for lunch afterwards? Thinking that, you know, I'm like, everything's going to be fine. Right. I was like, we're going to have lunch with my husband. I might be like, brass and have like a glass of wine and going about my business and go to work drunk like so I go in and she like the receptionist kind of gave me this weird look and I'm like what Holly I'm like what the hell what I'm like I'm here I need to go see Monica she's like yeah go in lets me in I go in her office and she's like you have cancer like straight off the rip like didn't even sugarcoat it I was like what she's like you have colon cancer she's like is you know, adenocarcinoma, of the sigmoid colon. She's like, it's, it's positive, um, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, oh. So I call work. I was like, I'm not feeling good. I'm going to just take the rest of the day off. I go meet my husband at the restaurant. I was like, I have cancer. Like, very stoic. And he's like, I know. He's like, I've known since last night. And, like, I lost it. Then I came home. Literally by the time we both walked in the house, my oncologist's office was on the phone with me and they're like, so we got a referral. What do you do for a living? What's your occupation? I was like, I'm a hospice administrator. They're like, no, really? Like, what do you do? I was like, I am a hospice administrator. <laughs> and they're like, what? I was like, yeah, I just admitted to colon cancer terminal patients on Monday. Like, no big deal. Then my surgeon's office calls. They're like, so what do you do for a living? I was like, oh my God. I was like, I work in hospice. They're like, no. I was like, I work in hospice. I'm like, so, you know, the stigma, I already knew what the end game was. I just didn't know how close to the end game I was. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and of course my boss is being a complete, you know what, this whole time, because I hadn't told him and I had no desire to tell him all that time. So Thursday comes and goes. Friday I go in for my MRI CT scan and my sister-in-law's best friend happens to be part of the radiology group at the hospital that reads all the CTs. So she happened to be in the hospital when I went in for my MRI. And she called her. She came and met me. And I was like, hey, I'm so sorry to meet you under these circumstances. I'm like, but I want to ask you for a favor. And we walked off. And I said, if my cancer is everywhere and I don't have a fighting chance, can you please tell my husband first? so that he can prepare me as to how I'm going to tell my children that their mom's going to die. And she's like, that's not going to happen. So I get my scans and then we go home and I tell the girls, I go upstairs because Meredith's like, I'm going to get this red as soon as possible. I'll let you know. So uh, my kids go upstairs and I was like, we're going to go to dinner, go get dressed. And we literally wait in silence for a text message. So my husband's like, Oh, I got a text. He's like, your doctor's going to call you in a minute. And, um, she calls me and she's like, Hey, by the way, 
It's not in any organs, but I think you might be like a three at the most. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? She's like, you're not going to die today. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, whatever. So we go out to eat and I had like two of the largest margaritas I could ever could have get my hands on. And I come home and I sit my girls down. My son's five. He really could care less. And I was like, I just want y'all to know that something came up on my test and I have cancer. And they looked at me and they laughed like, mom, you're so not funny. Like, this is not cool. Because if you know me, every time somebody's sick, I'm like, oh my God, you're pregnant. That's like my, <laughs> that's like my go-to. <laughs> I'm like, you're pregnant. Um, but they, um, that was kind of intense. So from there, like everything was just like, a the world was in a tailspin. My husband and I had a trip planned, um, to go to like a Sturgill Simpson concert in Charlotte. So I was oh, like, nice. there's no, yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, so we still went through with that. Um, the week after I had my resection surgery, I love my surgeon I cursed out my night shift nurse because I was at the hospital they um put you on a ketamine drip to like especially patients that have abdominal like severe abdominal colorectal surgery they were doing this study where putting patients on like a heavy ketamine dosage and drip for 24 hours reduced the risk of them becoming dependent on narcotics upon discharge so, like, I don't remember a lot of things. I know that um, I showed up for the day of my resection, and they never mentioned anything about an ostomy until they were literally wheeling me out to the OR, and this nurse walks in. She's like, where do you wear your pants? And I'm like, right here. Why? And she starts putting X's on my stomach. And oh, I'm like, what are you goodness. doing that for? <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing that for? And she's like, in case you need a bag. I'm like, what bag? Like, I'm so naive at this point. Like, why would you know? I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, an ostomy. I was like, what's an ostomy? She's like, oh, you know, um, a poop bag. I'm like, a poop bag. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, whatever. So I'm like hysterically crying. My husband starts crying because I'm crying of all the people, like I'm prepared and I'm ready for this and that. So, um, I wake up on this ketamine drip and lo and behold, I lift my gown in the middle of the hallway and I'm like, hello, do I have a bag? Do I like screaming at the top of my lungs? It's like, do I have a poop bag? Somebody, and my husband's like, oh my God, Mariel. He's like, I heard you coming down the hall. Uh. And the nurse, <laughs> and the nurse, <laughs> the nurse just kept yelling, ma'am, ma'am, you're, you're okay. You don't have one. You can pull your gown back down. Ma'am, you, you're okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> oh man. I was like, oh, now there's anything wrong with an ostomy. Listen, if I had to get an ostomy and it was going to save my life and give me the best quality of life in the world, I would be like, you can cut me open while I'm awake right here and give me one. I mean, I've got um, one and guess what? I don't want it. Nobody wants one. No, but if it's going to keep me six feet above ground, mm -hmm. you, you can put one on my forehead if you need it to. <laughs> <laughs> like I am... Um, I am so pro stoma. Like, yes, please. Um, I had a little girl in the ER when I worked at the medical university and she had an ostomy. I didn't know about it. And I heard her fart and I thought it was so funny. Right. I was like, ha ha ha. I'm just joking with her. And then I see this thing like inflate under the bed. I'm like, Oh my God, what is happening? And she lets the she releases the air out of the bag and I'm like oh my god and her dad walks in he's like I am so sorry she thinks it's so funny to fart in her bag and then let the air out and not tell people that she's got a bag and I'm like <laughs> it is funny that's awesome I'm like this little girl just legit Dutch oven me in this room <laughs> and didn't even tell me and I just went on about my business so I'm like oh so I, I think of this little girl every time but anyhow so that's that's that then you know, he um, didn't tell me anything. And a couple weeks after that, I met with my oncologist. And 
I was so determined. I was like, it's not a big deal. I'm going to be a stage two and I'm going to just go on about my business. And he's like, um, you're three B, um, blah, blah, blah. And I was very sad, obviously. Tell everybody what three B means, please. So three B means that my tumor had gone outside the intestinal wall and into the surrounding lymph nodes. So my surgeon took out all the lymph nodes um, right outside of my colon, but then he also took out 30 right by my liver to make sure that there was no metastatic disease or had not gone anywhere else, which I'm very thankful for. Um, So four of my lymph nodes came back positive. So that bumped me up to a stage 3B. Mm -hmm. Had I had a couple of lymph nodes more, I would have more than likely ended up with an ostomy. I I know a lot of good um, 3C colon patients that do have one. Um, They're mostly right-sided. I thankfully was left-sided, which in the cancer world, like stepping into it, you're like, what really is the difference? Because when I started working at the Alliance, they were like, oh, sigmoid, that's left side. It's like, that's the side that you want to have cancer on. I was like, how about no side to have cancer on? Like, what are you, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? They're like, left-sided cancer is a lot less aggressive than right side. Hmm. Because, um, suppose, yeah. Because it just has, um, it's a lot closer to a lot of other things. Um, so I was like, okay. Um, but at the end of the day, to me, cancer is still cancer, you know? Yeah, my um, oncologist, when I had the recurrence, he, he smiled. He goes, come on, and I got good news for you. I said, I don't have cancer? He goes, oh, you do. He goes, but you got the good kind. I know. It's like, what is that? Like, what? He goes, it, it didn't metastasize through your lymph nodes. It metastasized through the portal veins. It traveled up. And oh, th- yeah. I'm like, oh, yay. Mm-hmm. Lucky now, me. in the world of rectal cancer metastasized to the liver, I did have the good kind because it didn't yeah. go on into the lymph nodes it went through the portal veins and some cells must have cancer cells must have traveled up through those veins into my liver and sat there and hit out yeah and grew but yeah it's very odd thing when your oncologist says like oh good i'm happy to see you know you're lucky like yeah lucky there's let's put some context around the word lucky shall we yeah i know it's like geez but I think the day that I was told I was 3B was the last day that I thought about myself because my fight took a completely different meaning. Um, I was like, what do I need to do to make it to the end? What do I need to do to be around for my children? Mm -hmm. Um, And what do I need to do to help somebody else not have to go through this? And that literally is what drove me. Like, I became so open and I got a lot of backlash for it for being as raw as I was through my diagnosis and my journey but I really didn't care because who the hell wants to think and imagine that a cancer diagnosis is cupcakes and rainbows so what is this backlash you went through can you say more about that like why why do you have to talk so much about your about the importance of screening? Like, why are you talking so much about all of the side effects that you're experiencing? Like, why do you have to um, do this? And I was like, because it's my reality. I was like, what makes you think that somebody is not experiencing something like I'm going through and they have no idea who to turn to? Or that somebody's telling them that they're too young or that somebody's telling them that, Oh, don't worry about it. It's just stress. IBS is going to end up going away. Within my first month of being diagnosed, one of my girlfriends, because of my story, was diagnosed with stage 2 rectal cancer. Oh, my gosh. And so how were you voicing this? Oh, all over my Facebook. Social media? Oh, yeah, social media. Yeah, when I was diagnosed in 2007, Facebook, I don't even know if it had come out yet, but if it had, you know, we didn't really know about it. I think I got on Facebook in 2008. Yeah, I think... 07 was when I first learned about Facebook, and it really wasn't even that big of right. a deal as it is now. <clears throat> yeah. be like, you'd get a Facebook friend, and you'd like write on their wall, hi, <laughs> it's been 27 years, how are you? Right, That's when like, just, the poke 
You remember the poke thing? Oh, I do like, remember poking that's people so on creepy. Facebook. <laughs> but when I got diagnosed, I started a blog, and <clears throat> excuse me, it quickly went from this is my diagnosis and my symptoms and treatment to this is what I'm dealing with today emotionally. This is what I don't want you to know about right now. This is what I'm ashamed of. Like I started mm. putting it out there for the same reason you were, because I'm like. Oh my gosh, if I'm constrained by the cultural expectations and the taboo of personal sharing, then that means everybody else is. And in that training, I told you that I'd gone through that six month training. Actually, it was a different training prior to that one, where what we learned about is when we tell on ourselves, we then have freedom to actually be. We spend so much of our time hiding who we are in fear of not connecting with others. Yet when we speak about who we really are and what's really going on with us, that's when we have the most profound connections. And Brene Brown led the way in the, you know, in the public world, really, you know, just w with her first TED Talk about that. You know, Brene Brown, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, and, and let everybody know. It's like, yeah, what you're most ashamed of? Yeah, so is everybody else. And when you don't talk about that, you actually just, you know, you don't have connection with others. So I did what, you did, except in my, well, if my father was still alive when I was diagnosed, he probably would have been like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Or just kind of sat back and observed. I mean, who knows? But <laughs> my mom, my whole family was like, well, that's Bert. That's, that's Bert. Bert just kind of, you know, when I was a kid, someone would ask me how I'm doing. And I would tell them when I was an adult, you ask me, hey, how are you doing? I didn't hear hello. I said, how are you? You said, how are you doing? And I tell people and I've kind of always been that way so i know what you mean but it's interesting i didn't get any backlash and you were like yeah. no like i want people to know i want people to not go through what i've gone through i want them to see yeah. the symptoms god forbid they see the symptoms that i've had they're not gonna go through two months of ibs treatment they're gonna go get scoped they're gonna do a what you, a, a fit test mm-hmm Hallelujah. Thank the world for you, Mario. Yeah. But it's, you that, know. That stirred some my, things up, though, huh? <laughs> yeah. Like, my work weaponized my, my post kind of, like, against me because through this process, like, I never missed a day of work. I showed up every single day. I, would, I purposely chose my chemo treatment center because it literally was within a two minute driving distance from my office. So I would show up every day, they would put me in a private room and I would pull out my laptop, hook it up. My husband would be sitting there doing his thing or my mom, whoever was with me that day. And I would literally be sitting there cranking out emails, taking conference calls the entire time I was in treatment. I wouldn't even go home when I was done. I would have my husband drop me off at my office finish out my work day with my chemo pump in tow mm -hmm. and then show up the next day and then get on hooked on Saturday morning and crash and burn for 24 hours. Like I literally was married to a job that wanted to date me. And it was very, for me, it was very hard because I literally still showed up. I still, didn't like cancer, like my cancer became more of a problem for everybody else, but for me. And I hated that because it was like, this is for me to deal with. It's not, it's not on you. It's, it's me. I'm the one that's having to handle this. So I would still wake up like at five in the morning and do my two hour drive to my other office and see my nurses and talk to our patients and their families and come on back to Charleston. Like it was nothing like, and so your employer yeah. weaponized that. Oh, yeah. Like, I had a whole report written up as to how my staff feels uncomfortable with me showing up to work with my chemo pump in tow. But there was another, there was a social worker at another office that had breast cancer. Um, and everyone, she had the same manager and they completely treated her perfectly fine. And she was like, oh, yeah, he's so great. He's so supportive. And I'm like, really? I'm like, that's, that's great to know. Um, but at the end of the day, literally, it's a blessing. So 
Um, I lost my hair second round. By the time that I got to my 10th round, um, chemo started becoming a little harder. So on my 11th round, I, it was December 28th and I go in and my husband and I were laughing and they just started running my oxaliplatin and he, I was like, babe, why don't you go to Walmart? It was down the street. I was like, go ahead and get what we need. If anything happens, I'll call you. He's like, all right, cool. So he leaves. I was like, bring me back um, like some fries from McDonald's or something. He's like, all right. So he leaves and comes back. You know, while he's gone, my dad was happened to be visiting from the Dominican Republic. He speaks no English. So he's just sitting there with me. And I start going through this like awful sneezing attack. And I was like, oh, man. I was like, this stinks. So I'm like really stuffy. And my dad's like, your face is really red. I was like, oh, it's just, I just sneeze. Like, I just, I don't feel really good. My nurse walks by that happens to be my friend. And she's like, holy crap, Marielle. She's like, you are, you're really red. Like, what is wrong with you? And I start talking to her. I was like, I don't know. I'm like, I just feel really hot. I just, she's like, you don't sound good. I was like, I just got done sneezing for like 10 minutes straight. I was like, I'm, my sinuses were super clogged. I was like, I don't know what's going on. She's like, all right, let me know if you need anything. She walks off, comes back by, pokes her head in. I am legit covered in hives. My lips are like swollen. Oh, no. My eyes like itching, so I'm just going like this, not thinking anything. We're like completely like almost swollen shut. She's like, oh, my God. She's like, we got to stop this. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I could barely talk. So she's like... I'm like, I got to call my husband. So she calls my nurse practitioner. I mean, my PA and she comes in and she's like, holy crap, call Keog, which is my oncologist. He was like on the other side in clinic. My oncologist is a very shy man. He's a man of very few words. He's not very confrontational. Personality wise, you would automatically know we would never mix like patient provider, but we did. He literally steps in that doorway and he goes, oh, excuse me. He's like, holy fucking shit. Like screams it out loud. He's like, I need everybody in here. A nurse rolls in with a crash card. I am getting stabbed with an EpiPen on my leg. I am like, what is happening? My dad, not speaking the language, is like backed up in a corner. Oh hysterically crying on the phone with my mom. She's like, you need to call Mac. He needs to come back to, off to the hospital. Something's wrong with Marielle. I don't know what's wrong. My mom's trying to call me. I can't answer. And I'm like, my airway, like literally my lips start turning purple. They've like shoved this like full thing of oxygen. Like I know they're like on my third EpiPen in my leg. I am literally crashing and burning and I'm texting my husband like 911. So like my friend calls, she's like, oh, nothing important. Just something's happening to Mariel. You really need to come back. So I almost get taken to the ER, like crash cart and everything. My husband shows up and I have like all this tubing, all this stuff. I am bead red, swollen and everything. And he's like, what the heck is happening to my wife? And they're like, um, your wife almost just died. Like legit. So mm. they keep me there. They, st they stop chemo. Um, I am like, I have blood all over my pants from like all the epi shots I ended up getting. I didn't even care. I was like, whatever. Um, like half naked in front of my dad with his door open. I'm just like, somebody just saved me. And I'm like, this is not how I planned on dying. Like I was not planning on dying on chemo. Like what is happening? So I get sent home with the precautions. Like if anything happens, she needs to go to the ER. Literally as we were about to pull up into my driveway, my employer calls me and tells me that I'm too expensive on our insurance and they're firing me and letting me go. So my husband takes the phone I, I from to, me. May I pause you for a moment? <laughs> so a hospice organization, which is a, you know, a compassion-based organization, mm. is firing you because it's costing them too much mm. to have you so, on the insurance. So, yeah. Is that so, even, first of all, bes besides wondering if that's even legal, I'm like, my employer... When I couldn't work, and when I was on, because I couldn't handle the chemo, I was on full disability. Mm -hmm. 
they continued to pay their share of my insurance for probably a year and a half until they very gently called my wife and asked and said, look, your husband hasn't been employed with us for a year and a half, like, or some number, I don't even remember anymore. But yeah, right, so, right. And they were like, you know, would you, you know, we'd like you to move on a different insurance. We'd like to st stop, you know, they went above and beyond. Right. Your employer is like, m you're mid-treatment, you almost die in treatment, and they call you and they say, we got to let you go because you're a financial right. burden. And it also happens to be the day before I go on FMLA, right? So FMLA? Yeah. I was eligible for FMLA the day after my allergic reaction. Which is? They knew family medical leave of absence. You know, like when you're pregnant? No, 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 like no, no. You, that couldn't, they didn't undo it so you could go on family no. medical leave of absence? I was like, can I please, can, like, can you try to fire me like after tomorrow? I was like, I really just wanted to go on FMLA tomorrow. I was like, I just almost died on chemo today. I'm like, I really can't do this. So anyhow, my husband hears this. He takes the phone out of my hand, and I'm just so spent. Like, I just walk out the car, and I just hear my husband's like, who fires somebody with cancer? Like, did and he just goes off, and of course he's mad. I don't feel like dealing with it. So I'm like in my own la la land. I legit come upstairs. My mom's in the living room with like my aunt and my girls and everything because she had them all day and all the stuff was happening. So of course my kids knew that I almost died. And I, my mom comes to hug me. She's like, Hey baby, are you okay? And I'm like, I just got fired. I was like, I just want to go to sleep. I'm like, I don't feel good. I'm like, I might need to go to the ER later. I don't know, mom. I'm like, come check with me. Make sure I don't die. And I went off to my room and my kids came upstairs crying like, oh, my God. I was like, whatever. I don't I know just if anybody listening to this right now <sighs> can even hear what you're saying because they're all still stuck on your boss fired you. Yeah. Knowing. Yeah. No, my boss was a cut. Yeah. And my boss didn't. He called HR and had HR do it. And HR, no one in HR <laughs> had the decency to say, yeah. hey, pal. Give her one more day. She's going through cancer, stage three. She needs to be on family, me family medical leave absence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nobody there, not only did they not think yeah. of it, but when your husband mentioned it, when you mentioned it, they still yeah. wouldn't change their mind. Yeah. So then That probably would have cost uh, them money. Is that why? Oh, we're um, a right-to-work state. They can fire anybody just for looking bad the wrong way. Yeah. So you, did oh, you it like, gets better. Did you take your lunch breaks like throwing rocks at your boss's car? Was there maybe a reason why your boss does? I mean, my what? boss didn't even live in the same city that I worked in. My boss lived two hours away. So you had to drive two hours to throw rocks at your boss's car. A rock wouldn't be sufficient at that point. Oh my goodness! I never heard of such yeah. a thing. I didn't know people were capable. Of, I mean, I did know, but I've never met anyone uh, who. It's just you know, it's it's very. For me, that what that literally like, it. Ha I think it's been the most traumatic part of my entire, um, of my entire cancer fight, losing my job in the manner that I did. Um, it was something that I loved, but mind you, outside of that came like I don't even know why I get emotional talking about it I just I think it's just so whatever um people can just be very vicious and take advantage of I don't know but anyhow I'm very thankful that I endured such a loss like that because it eventually led me to be in the place that I am where I get to help others and like I truly mean that it's like I don't consider my job a job. Like, I am truly blessed that my boss actually opened up my email um, and gave me the opportunity to prove that I had what it took to not just be a navigator, but the little bit that I knew of our disease through my personal experience was enough to be able to do what I do now in the platform that I do it on. So that is my silver lining out of that.
I really, I think that's like the most painful part of it. Yeah. 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 I <laughs> yeah. completely understand what you're saying, how it actually worked out for you and you're happier where you are now. It sounds like it's more fulfilling. I mean, I can't get my head around a place that would be uncomfortable with a like one of my employees chemo pump because well, you don't want to make people uncomfortable about cancer and death and treatment because we're busy doing hospice work. Like well, really one of my one of my marketing guys sent out an like a huge email to the vice president of my division. And he was like, like, I didn't even know this email was coming out. And he said, I just want to talk about the elephant in the room that happens to be Mariel's cancer. Like, what are we going to do about this? And I write back, I was like, what do you mean? What are we going to do about this? I'm like, didn't you say that it was my cancer? Like, that's for me to decide what I'm going to do about it. Yeah. Like, it was more of like, I don't know. I have never... I don't know. I just, but it is what it is. I hate saying that, but it, <laughs> well, you know, it literally is what it is. The perspective that I have on this life. Everything that has happened to me has gotten me to where I am. And yes. some of the most difficult experiences that I've been handed are the ones that provided me the biggest push to get me where I am and when I say that I don't say it like so therefore we should appreciate whatever happens it's like no when I got diagnosed with cancer I was devastated I was crushed I was screaming at the ceiling when I was home alone why me I'm not one of these people why is this happening to me and it ended up being the thing that woke me up and had me stop pretending in life had me had stopped me but had me stop playing small. I was living life like, like life was a dress rehearsal. I was living life like life was a dress rehearsal. And once I got diagnosed, I'm like, wait, this is it. This is the real deal. You get one shot. How are you going to live your life? And I was hiding out, scared to be me, afraid of being judged, not being who I wanted to be in the world. So cancer was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. I agree with that 100%. I, 100 percent. Right on. And I cried my eyes out. There was times I'd be praying, and all of a sudden I'm praying and crying, then I'm praying and sobbing, then I'm sobbing and begging to not die. And I'm having terrible experiences. I couldn't work. I was sick. And yet, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. So, like, I'm not suggesting that with your former employer, you'd be like, oh, well, it was a great thing. It's like, no. People were being shit. And what resulted is you actually got where you wanted to be. But that doesn't yeah. mean that we excuse right. or condone certain behavior. It's like, like life is here really to provide all of us what we need. And like, you know, if we look at uh, great literature and movies, you know, the character of the fool is so valuable. Because it's often the fool that brings our awareness to something none of us would have seen. So you need the character. You need the, you need the fool. You need the evil person. You, you know, but that doesn't mean that we like them or condone what they do. Like your boss and the people involved in that decision behaved in a way that was unacceptable. Yeah. And we can be grateful for what life provides us, but still not mm -hmm. condone or encourage support you know that kind of behavior yeah. it's an interesting dance right it's like yeah yeah but you know i i know for a fact that at the end of the day god's gonna have the last laugh when it comes to that um because he's gonna make it all right yeah we it's are not all for providing. me yeah I, my guess would be and what the hell do i know I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. when i'm dead i'll let everybody know but yeah. i would imagine that those people, they had their head hit the pillow and they had certain thoughts. They woke up and looked in the mirror. They had to deal with themselves because human beings love to give other people the impression 
oh, I got this. This isn't bothering me. Human beings mm-hmm. love to pretend, not all human beings, but it's very common for human beings to pretend that when their head hits the pillow, they're not thinking about the things they did. I'm fine. Mm-hmm. Like those people who made those decisions, Mariel, those people who let you go at the worst time possible, even when you ask them to please wait one day, they still have to think about who they are. And they may not do it for their entire life. They may not do it until they're very old. But it, you know, the, uh, what's that phrase? The uh, chickens come home to roost? Mm-hmm. I don't know how. I, I'm, I'm famous for ruining every... Uh, um, uh, cliche and I can't ever I always misquote things but you know it's like they do have to deal with who they are yeah and it doesn't escape you I mean the only way I can imagine that kind of thing well no I'm not going to sell that it, they have to deal with who they are yeah but you know the crazy thing through all this um, is my stomach just growled really bad. So I'm like, I hope the recording did I'll that. edit that out. You can just start saying <laughs> what you were saying again. I am like, oh my God, my stomach. Um, but through my entire diagnosis, like we don't understand really the reasons why certain things happen. And, you know, culturally speaking, we're very religious. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, I never like dwelled on the why me why me kind of thing I turn it into like God like what is my purpose like there's a reason why this is happening to me like show me what I'm supposed to do with this Mm -hmm. and honestly that is one of the few reasons as to why I made it through granted the other ones were I I tell people often I laugh a lot to kind of like deflect from like sadness and pain and whatnot but like my biggest fears I'm very I'm very Latin I'm the epitome of like what a Latin woman is like I'm very dependent I'm very self-sufficient like I am that mom I am a very not jealous like crazy wife but it's like my husband's mine like you can look but you don't order off the menu you don't sample like you just (laughs) you're welcome to whatever just you don't so, like, for me, I... You love the relationship analogy. You use that for everything. <laughs> I do. Like, and you know what, though? After cancer, I find myself providing a lot more analogies to, analogies to kind of explain what I feel because I notice that in my survivorship, after chemo, like, I do suffer a lot from chemo brain, but I feel as though I've lost some ability to articulate certain things like verbally articulate Mm -hmm. just because I find myself unable to fully explain my train of thought or like my thought process. And I think losing my job has a lot to do with that because it made me feel I was not capable of performing at X level. I think it's just all in my head. But I find myself literally running, like beating around the bush and saying 5,000 words just to say, hey, dinner's ready. So analogies have become my thing of kind of explaining what I'm trying to explain without having to say 5 million things, but also so that if what I say comes off in a certain way, I don't want you to take it in the wrong way. You know, like, it's, I'm very sarcastic, I always have been, but sometimes when I say things, I feel so awkward, because to me, it doesn't make sense, it might make total sense to you, but, like, my self-doubt makes me feel as though, like, you might take it the wrong way, but you really won't, you're like, oh, I didn't think of that at all, kind of like right now, like, I'm just rambling, and I can't find the words to say what I'm trying to say. Well, you're trying to put words (laughs) to your occasional sad. inability to put words to things. Yeah. It's a tough thing to put words to. I know. I, um, this is so, like, I really, I've never sat and talked about how I feel about having cancer. This really is, like, the first time I've ever talked about this. Mm. Well, like, I- literally, it's like, it's, this is, like, very, it's good for me. It's very out of my comfort zone. I don't like talking about myself. Well, yeah. One, 
<laughs> two things to say. <laughs> One is it's an honor that you agreed yeah. to have this conversation with me. And you are, the other thing I want to say is that you're the 35th person that I've had as a guest mm -hmm. that I've interviewed. <coughs> Excuse me. And two of those I had to do twice. So I've actually yeah. done 37 interviews. And you noticed I learned something about my experience just speaking with you. Like I, I learned know. a great deal about myself each time I have a conversation with another survivor like this. It's uh Yeah. It provides so much. It's like journaling. Like when you write down what you're going through, it, it takes it out of the monologue in your mind and it puts it down for you to observe. Like Yeah. This sitting in the waiting room, chatting with someone, fellow patient, being on the phone with someone at work where, you know, for the uh, Colon Cancer Alliance, you know, it does bring up bits and pieces. But when we really sit down and have this conversation from start to yeah. finish, it's something very different. And that's why I won't do a 45 minute <laughs> podcast or a 60 minute podcast. There are a bunch of cancer podcasts out right now and they do like an hour because they know that's the, <laughs> that's the standard. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, but they don't. And, and, and they're great podcasts, so I'm not suggesting otherwise, but what arises out of the conversations that we have, you and I have been on for more than a couple of hours, yeah. and it, it brings to the surface something that isn't available mm -hmm. with a short conversation. So yeah. it is intentional, and it really is an honor to have you on. and Thank providing you. You're welcome. And providing all these listeners yeah. with yeah. a view um, maybe hold on one second how do I want to say this providing all of these listeners with a perspective that wouldn't be made available to them otherwise and they're all feeling the same emotion that you're feeling. Mm. I'm feeling the same emotion that you're feeling right now. And this is something we share. This is something that isn't spoken. This is something that often just gets managed, dealt with, yeah. filed away. And it's what we're all dealing with every day. I'm nine and a half years out. And today in this conversation with you, I discovered trying to even think of what it was but today in this conversation with you I discovered something about myself that I wasn't fully aware of you know mm -hmm. and yeah it's a very it's a very intimate conversation it's very personal yeah yeah and you're rocking it thank you <laughs> I just I don't know and it's out of your comfort zone so thank you thank it you it is thank so you. like that most of the stuff we talk about is like, and I don't even get emotional. Well, I do because I'm still thinking about what I was going to say. But like, I, I don't know. I just, I have, I really, I don't like talking about myself. It's just, it's just very hard. I, I still try to deny myself the idea that I had cancer. Like sometimes I catch myself and I'm like, holy crap. Like I literally like, you know, but it doesn't hit me until I lose a friend mm. of what I've, you know, like what I've had to go through. Like, yes, I fought just as hard as everybody else. Like I fought so that my girls, like I could see my girls grow up. I fought so and I laugh about this. I fought so that my husband doesn't have to get another wife. <laughs> my husband is something <laughs> like I literally like would have my children cremate me and put me in an urn next to my husband if I were to die so that his future girlfriend could see me every single night. <laughs> like I would be <laughs> like I would be vindictive like that. Like, I wanted to be around so that when my son got that one girlfriend for that one minute, I could think that I would be that mother-in-law that so many of us are blessed with. But I would be like, oh, my God, I can't do that to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like, see my girls walk down the aisle. It's like I had so much more of a harder time, and I still do because, 
unfortunately, this is, and forever, these fears will always be a part of my reality. You know, I am a very, I am invincible. So are you and so is everybody else. You know, cancer taught me that I am not as invincible as I thought I was. You know, I can be the badass that my mom raised me to be, but at the end of the day, I really don't have very much control of how much of a superhero I might be. And I feel really bad because, like, and I know why you said, like, you don't like hearing said, like, inspirational. My sisters have always put me, like, on this pedestal just because I'm the oldest and this is just what we do. But I admire my sisters in many ways as well. But they're like, you make life look so easy. Like, being a mom of four, like, I... Like, I was married at 23, had my daughter at 25, was divorced by the time I was 29. I took on my two stepdaughters that it was, it wasn't a walk in the park, but I have loved them. I've come from, like, uh, a broken home. I, I come from a divorced family, so we had f similar trauma, so I very much related, and my sisters did to my, to my stepdaughters, my girls, which I call them now, you know, they've been part of my life for almost 11 years. Yeah. Then I had my son and I'm like, you know, and then I had cancer. It's like everything that has happened, but in this whole process, like I made it look like a freaking piece of cake because in my head, I'm like, it's my job, not just to be strong, but to also prove to everybody that you, you can overcome this. Like, you know, your attitude gets you through it. But I had to learn in the shadows of my daily life. I had some very hard lessons that I learned every day. You know, I'm not capable of taking on the full load. And what killed me truly a lot of days was seeing my husband struggle in front of me. That was hard because it didn't matter what he did I felt as though inadvertently my husband felt like he was failing me on a daily basis. And that was hard for me to accept because it didn't matter how great he was. He couldn't take it away. He yeah. couldn't make it better. And honestly, like, I have such a soft spot for caregivers. Like, especially when it comes to the body program. And don't tell anybody that I said this. You can... You can leave that in there, by the way. But I told him one time, I was like, I do. Like, even though I get to talk to some incredible survivors and patients, like, I get to talk to patients like you that have been cancer twice, that you're so many years out of a stage four diagnosis. Like, who does that? You know, like, that's not supposed to happen. You know, yeah. I have all these, like, other patients that are 10, 12 years outside of a cancer diagnosis. Like, my near and dear friend Kim that I work with, she's also a young onset survivor. She's a stage, she's 13 years out of her stage four diagnosis. Like, holy crap. Like, I admire her tremendously. I We, like, laugh at each other. It's like, I think she's, like, my unavoidable girl crush. I'll just say it. I do. Mm -hmm. I think she's, like, I think she's so awesome. I mean, everything that she does, like, I've learned so much from her. I learn so much on how to deal with my PTSD and all these things that... I am able to unfortunately pour from an empty cup on the days that I have to pour from an empty cup and still keep my empathy on the days that, you know, her and I are both hysterically crying on a call because one of our patients died and we deal with our survivor's guilt, which, oh my God, is just a beast on its own that, you know, I think the people that we draw our strength from sometimes show up in an inadvertent way. And I have no idea how I started talking about that. Oh, my husband. You were speaking about caregivers. Yeah. And how but caregivers are, yeah, they are very extraordinary. Um, the fact that they're so selfless, like, you know, I'm sure that when you went through your first diagnosis, your ex-wife stepped up in ways that you probably never would have expected her to. Oh, she's amazing. Maybe. Amazing. And um, the reality is not all caregivers are selfless. No, like I, I had, I, you know, there's a whole yeah. group of people that I, my, I'm on. I don't remember which Facebook cancer group it is, but you know, one gal says like, you know, 
I was diagnosed with cancer. It's been a month, and now my husband is leaving me because of it. Yes. And then all these people chime on, and they go, oh, me too. What? And I'm like, what? What? I had three girlfriends going through breast cancer. They were older than me when I was going through colon cancer. Two other husbands left them. Now, what I... and Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And one of them literally looked at her and said... I can't do this. Let me know when treatment's over. I will come back. I would have been like, you can stay gone. Like, if you don't like me and love me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. So you need to just stay on out and just do your thing, my friend. Because, and then her cancer came back and he left her again. And I am like, you're stupid. I'm like, now you're stupid. I'm like, I don't feel bad for you this time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not laughing. It's just, I'm not laughing at her. I'm not laughing at the situation. I am just laughing because people are so... Because I'm something. trying to find words and you're just looking at me like with my mouth open, my jaw dropped. Because I can imagine what you're thinking. Well, and I'm just what, like, yeah, like thinking. you heard me right. You, you heard me right. It, what I have discovered through my experience... And through the experience of so many survivors I've spoken to, and I use the word mm -hmm. survivor speaking about people who are with us now and people that who have passed, because mm -hmm. I know many people who survived their diagnosis, but their diagnosis took their body anyway. Yep. But when we get diagnosed with cancer, it puts a microscope on every part of our marriage that isn't working. It puts a microscope on every part of our relationship with others, family, friends that isn't working and it brings it to the surface and I'm not going to suggest that there aren't people who when someone gets diagnosed that they just quit and leave like that's mm -hmm. pretty shocking and tough to swallow I'm amazed that your friend's husband had the courage to speak those words most people wouldn't have the courage to say that like, I can't do this I'm out call me when you're done like most people who couldn't handle it would probably keep their mouth <laughs> shut and pretend they can handle it and let the marriage fall apart in different ways. Uh, I'm not acknowledging the cat, but I'm like, yeah. there's something about that. But what I'm saying is like, I would imagine, you know, some relationships are going to collapse and fail because of a diagnosis. And so when you have a caregiver who's there by your side and there for you, it's really something to acknowledge. Like, I don't know what it's like to have a spouse who has mm -hmm. cancer, and I don't want to yeah. know. Yeah, no joke. I yeah. don't know what it's like to have, you know, like my, my son and stepson, like, you know, well, you know, my, my little, my, my guy was, you know, awfully little, so it wasn't until he was in, like, you know, once I'd been past it that he was like, it's a miracle you're even here. I'm like, yeah, buddy, I yeah. don't know what I'm here. People say, oh, you did this, you did that. I'm like, you want to know what I did? I got lucky because why am I here and someone else mm -hmm. isn't, you know? But the people in our lives, like, I would think quite often yeah. about my family members, my siblings, you know, my mom and stepdad, stepmom, my in-laws, like, Mm -hmm. It's got to be really hard to have someone in your life going through cancer because like you said about your husband, he's completely powerless. He can do all he wants for you, for the family, for the situation, but he can't take it away. And it's humbling. And I would say that if a person wants to take advantage of it, there's some freedom in that as well because Absolutely. the ego wants to be able to s protect you from it. And that means we live into being that kind of spouse. And it's culturally encouraged in stories and movies. And, 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 you know, what's really so is that no human being has the ability to keep another person alive. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that we respond to that like it's a sign of weakness yeah. is an error, is a misconception and a disservice to any human being. Like, it's, it's damn humbling. Like, our time with our loved ones is precious. We do not have the ability to keep them around. 
we are not, you know, the, the knight in shining armor that's going to stop everything. It's like, oh, if you're living like a knight in shining armor and then your spouse gets diagnosed with cancer, you're the knight in shining nothing. <laughs> being a goof, right? Because they're amazing for you and they support you. But you can't, you can't, you can't fight the dragon. Get sure. it? It's not your fight. And it's not your fight. And, uh, and, do, and I don't really call it dealing with cancer a fight, but since I went with the whole knight in shining armor analogy, yeah. now I got myself yeah. stuck in it. But, you know, it's like the, it's, 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 a, it's a profound, I would actually have never been there. So I would imagine it's a profound experience yeah. to. I don't want to be there either. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't ever want to endure that. But I, I'll tell you this. I was like, Mac, if this happens to you, I just want you to know I'm not going to be as nice as you have been to me. <laughs> I've given him, I've, <laughs> I've given him fair warning because if I can do it, I'm going to make sure that you suck it up and do it too. There's not going to be any pity party. I'm going to be like, yes, I know this really sucks. Like this really sucks, my friend, but I'm like... Let's go. I'm like, it's time for this. <laughs> I don't know. Your body's pretty tough. I couldn't handle chemo and work. I couldn't. Yeah. I was, I was, yeah. I was laid out. I'll look at people that are going yeah. to work after treatment. I'll be, or then I'll be like, what? What? I just vetted this guy. I just vetted this buddy the other day. And this man is like about six years older than me. And he legit goes to boot camp. With his chemo pump on <laughs> every Thursday. I am like, what is wrong with you? He's in the army? He's in the military? I am like, no, he's just like a normal person. Oh, boot camp, like you mean to a gym and work like, out? Like workout boot camp, yes. With his like... Damn. Because I was... <laughs> I'm like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I would go walking. Like, I would do stuff like on my lunch break. I'm like, I drive two hours to an office, work all day, turn around, come back. Like, 16-hour days. I'm like, you go work out with a chemo pump on. I am like, what is happening? I'm like, I admire you. Like, legit. Like, I, I was like, hats off to you. I will put you to share your story wherever I can plug you in. I am like, this is insane. You know, princess in the pea? That's me. I'm the princess. I can't even uh, handle a pea under my sheets. You think I could handle <laughs> chemo and go to work? I'm sleeping, and, and, and the fitted sheet gets kind of loose and folds under me when I'm sleeping. I will wake up. I oh, can't really? sleep with that. And you think I could uh, handle chemo? My body can't handle it. Can, like, my mind? I've been through some craziness. But, no. was, but oh, my goodness. So I think... The worst part is sleeping, learning to sleep with the chemo pump on. Like, my kids nickname it Roger. They're like, where's Roger? I'm like, who the heck is Roger? They're like, oh, your pump. He's like, I might as well give it a name. He's going to be around for a while. I'm Roger. like, okay. So, like, Roger and I became good friends, like, after round three when I figured out how to, like, sleep with him. That sounds so odd when I learned how to sleep with <laughs> Roger. <laughs> it took time. It ease into it. You know, Roger slept between Mac and myself every other week. Like, like what's happening in this podcast? Um, but now, like, learning how to sleep with this thing, and you're like, oh, my God, no. But, yeah, I cannot imagine. Yeah. When I lost my insurance, I had to go into the charity department because it obviously took really long for my COBRA paperwork to magically appear. So I had to go... <laughs> To the cherry department, and you know, like, the five of you pumps, how they're, like, super skinny and long, and you're like, oh, this is pretty cool. With the what? So, the you know, five of you. Did you ever get the five, five of you? Five of you, yeah. Yeah, you got the pump that you wore in the little bag. Yeah. Thing. Okay. The pump that they used in the charity clinic wasn't the thin one, the thin, long one. It was literally one that was, like, about this wide. And about this tall. I don't know about thin so. ones. I carried like a, an oversized Walkman around every time I had to do my... Every uh, yeah, that's what I had. But yeah, it was like the size of the Walkman. But no, not that one. Like There's a the small one, one that now? I legit... No, the one I got from the charity... When I had to go through the charity department, it literally was like... You see this keyboard? Oh my gosh. It was like... <laughs> it was like about that big. And like that thick oh my God. in a fanny pack. Oh my God. In a, I'm going to find the picture. I'm going to send it to you. Please do. And I'm like, I took a picture and I'm like, does this make my butt look big? And it literally is like sticking out like this far from my butt. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, 
walking around with this day. I was like, oh my God. But talk about caregiver. My husband's like, wow. You look so cute with a big fanny pack. I was <laughs> like, get away from me. I'm like, I'm like, I wouldn't be telling you that you look cute with your little fanny pack, chemo pom pom. Like a movie. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That fanny pack of chemo. That's oh, fabulous. I would look at that thing. It was, I found it revolting. True. But yeah, I talk about. It. I I learned how to deal with it. Like I, my sister took me to Charleston Food and Wine one year because it always falls on my birthday, and I literally went the first night with my chemo pump and tow. I was like, "Whoa, look at me!" And then the next day, I went to one event with my husband, and I took it out of the bag and I shoved it in like my vest. It was like an inside pocket, and like nobody knew until like I unzipped it and like all these wires were coming out, and mm. people are like, "What the hell is wrong?" Like, what is wrong with you? I was like, chemo. <laughs> like, just shove my tooth back in. <laughs> yeah, I went, I did a, uh, a fr- some, my friends, a lot of my friends are performers, and uh, <clears throat> we went and sang at a, it's uh, called Reggae Tuesday. It's an open mic reggae show. <clears throat> and, you know, the guys, they always wanted me to come down and sing, but, like, I just couldn't do it. And one day I had it in me, and I called two of my buddies that we sing together. We do this three-part harmony thing. Nice. And I'm like, hey, fellas, I think I think I need to do this. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah. So we went down, and there I am on stage. It was like this killer. All these reggae musicians coming together to, perf- you know, different oh, guys from it. different bands, right? And they all do this open mic thing, and they were doing uh, some of our tunes. And here I am singing, getting chemo. And <laughs> it's it's so wonderful when we are getting chemo and can step into a part of our life and keep living because for me i mean apparently apparently for you you didn't even notice you had chemo you just you were a rock star and it wasn't even an issue just kidding but for me it was so much harder that like you know when i could get out in the world and do something yeah you know it's empowering man like when you're in that mood and you're just like a normal person that just happens to be getting chemo at the same time. But, you know, when you get to experience that moment where your cancer is not front and center and you're still able to do something that you love, like, you know, in yeah. that singing thing, I think it's pretty awesome, man. It is. And this brings us back to what we were saying earlier about navigating cancer and finding a way to f- create or experience some normalcy in life. And then cancer's over. There's a whole different life you're living, and you're trying to again create some normalcy. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, you said it earlier, and I agree with you that you know it's not going away. I mean, for some folks, I don't know. I I hear about these mythical people that you know once they're done with cancer, they just move on. They don't talk about it. I guess those are maybe the folks you don't talk about things. But I'm a person who like. I talk about whatever's going on. I was, I, you know, I've had a made a really great friend, and um, he found out that I played music and performed. I had a band and stuff, and had a record, a CD, a record. Does anyone have records? And uh, he's like, I never knew this about you. How come I didn't know? I'm like, um, I don't know. I'm gonna guess, and maybe my guess is I don't talk about things that I'm not doing. When I'm talking about me, I talk about whatever is going on now, because I'm really, literally processing it and experiencing it in real time with you you know i'll say things to someone and be like i'll say something to someone and be like oh wow like i never even thought about that until it came out of my mouth and i said it to you you know mm-hmm. yeah so what was my point my point i think was that this experience for me didn't end like people would say oh well you'll be able to put cancer behind you and not talk about it i'm like it's not behind me Mm -hmm. i'm still discovering parts of myself nine and a half years out from the second diagnosis yeah i'm still 14 years out from the first one like i'm still discovering parts of myself and it's it for many of us it doesn't mean it's always at the forefront of our mind and it's always in our face, but it means that it occasionally just comes back out and reveals itself. And it says, you know, here, here's an aspect of this. Here's a perspective on this. Here's a, 
here's something about you you hadn't seen before that's now all of a sudden just, you know, it's arising. Like, that's really what it is. People are like, how come, you know, why is it still a part of my life? Because I'll be going through my day, and all of a sudden this whole emotional thing, like, bubbles up, like water coming out of the sand, you know? Mm-hmm. Like when you're on the ocean and the tide comes up and you see it bubbling through the sand, it's like more and more arises, and it arises at its own pace, the way grief yeah. Ar- ar- arrives at its own pace. Time out. You you looking at the clock or something? You got to go? No, I'm just scratching my head. Okay, because you were looking down for a bit, which is cool. You do whatever. I just wanted to make sure that. Oh, no. Because we've been going for a while now. <laughs> no, I'm good. All right. So, yeah, it's uh, as long as it's going to continue to arise within me, I'm going to deal with yeah. it. Yeah. I've never been yeah. the kind of person who just takes the past and buries it. It's just uh. I can't. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I agree. That's very well said, I will say, that, you know, your cancer is like, you have not, it's not like a door that you shut, like it's still a very present thing. Yeah. How do you deal, all right, how do you deal with loss being a survivor as far as you've gotten? When someone else dies of cancer? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when you say, how do I deal with it? Can you be a little more specific? Like, how do you process it without feeling guilty of your survivorship? Especially you truly being so far NED from stage four. Well, naturally, my heart breaks whenever I lose anyone. Uh... Early on, and when I say early, I mean like, well, two years out after my second diagnosis, an old friend who I'd been trying to get a hold of, I just couldn't find him or like, you know, I'd do searches online, I'd use social media to try to find him, right? And then one day, my brother texts me, he's like, hey, uh, did you hear about Ross? And he, and it, this is him, right? And he shows me, a, sends me a picture of a state trooper who had died. And a friend of mine, you know, he was a, you know, middle school and high school friend. Like, we laughed so much. I love this dude. And we reconnected after he got, he got out of the Marines. And we reconnected a little bit when he was in, we were both in college at the local community college. But we never really started hanging out again. And I wanted to reach out to him, connect with him. And found out he died. He was on a routine training. He was training some guys uh, on rappelling. And he, you know, unclipped and went to do something and fell and in a ravine and died. And I couldn't go to his funeral. Now, I'm the guy, Marielle, when someone dies, I go. It's what you do. Mm-hmm. Nobody, mm-hmm. What do you mean you're not going to the funeral? Nobody wants to go to the funeral. Are you kidding me? Nobody says, oh, what do I want to do today when I wake up? I want to go to a funeral. You go. That's what you do. That's how I am. I couldn't mm-hmm. go because I, was, I, I didn't go to a funeral for two different people. And one guy died of cancer. And I didn't go because when I went to a funeral, I would see myself in the casket. And the family was my family. And mm-hmm. the children were my children. I couldn't go. I couldn't. And I finally realized, started having a little more compassion for people who don't go. It's like, yeah, you do think people should, but don't should on people because that's not very polite. <laughs> but I, I got a different perspective on it. As time has gone on, though, and I've gotten a little more breathing room, a little more space for my own potential immediate you know, mortality or however I want to say that. How I deal with, I don't have survivor's guilt. And the reason I don't, I believe why I don't is because I rolled the dice and they landed, you know, sevens. I don't know why someone else rolled them they got snake eyes. And for anybody listening to this who plays dice, I don't even know what the hell those things even mean, so I probably got it all wrong. (laughs) I don't know why I'm still alive. I'm I'm alive because I'm lucky. And am I lucky? And and I say that like, is someone unlucky that they died? I don't know. I mean, I'm getting all philosophical, but like, I don't know why I'm here, Mariel. I don't know why I didn't die. 
either time. Yeah. Uh, so I don't feel guilty because I don't have any say. There are times when, like, when someone is dying, and I will feel a little uncomfortable because I'm like, or someone's going through uh, post treatment. Like, you know, this one cat who's in a support group I'm in, or at least he was. He's got tonight. He's got, he's got neuropathy so bad. We were talking neuropathy. I'm like, oh, well, I try this and I try that. Then I found out he's talking about intense pain in his mm -hmm. hands and feet. And the only medication that works gives him tinnitus. Oh. Right. And then there's people that are in the colorectal support group and they have like serious pooping problems. And I'm like, oh, well, I got my colostomy over here. I'm chilling. <laughs> like, I know this one, like that colostomy bag is fabulous. You have You're one? like, I don't have that. No. Oh, I'm like, I wait, have what? like, I have like, sometimes I like, I have like, I still have chronic constipation since my resection surgery. I, it doesn't matter what I do. I've had to like finagle with my diet. Like I can't process gluten anymore. Like gluten makes me really, really constipated. I still get constipated regardless, but um, I've learned that eliminating certain things because unfortunately my doctor doesn't have a magic angel be all kind of fix it book. They don't know. So they, like, we found a treatment that, that cured yeah. you of your cancer, but we don't know how to deal with the constipation that resulted from the cancer or the yeah. constipation that resulted from the cancer or what damage has been done to your body to save your life. Oh yeah. Like, Speaking of neuropathy, I didn't experience neuropathy until after I was done with treatment, so I never had the privilege and the joy of asking my doctor to turn it down, um, turn down my dosing right. for my chemotherapy. So I went full blast, like from <laughs> round one to round 14, like full blast. Um, and it literally has kicked my butt. It hasn't even been into like the last six months that I have found like additional response on top of medication with other things that I've supplemented in that yesterday was the first time I've been able to run in eight months. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So to get back to what you're saying or what you're asking me, yeah, sometimes, how do you, I, how do yeah, you? sometimes I feel uncomfortable around people who had it worse than me. Mm -hmm. But or I feel bad for them and I don't want to, uh, you know, it's like, it's kind of like, let's say you run marathons and you won the race and you're having that conversation in front of someone who fell down and wasn't able to finish. Right. You know, you're just like, I'm not trying to like, you know, I don't want anybody feeling bad. I don't want any, I don't, I don't want to, I don't like to, uh, you know, I'm always, I don't ever want to seem boastful in front of somebody who's struggling. But so I don't feel guilt, but I do try to be mindful. And the reason I don't feel guilt is because I had nothing to do with why I'm still alive other than like I followed the treatment. I know someone who like stopped getting treatment because she didn't want to do it anymore and then went back and then the the doctors, you know, strongly advised against it. And what happened is she passed because it gave the cancer the jump that it wanted, you know? Like, That's awful. but I don't, maybe you could say more about the guilt you're asking about because maybe I'm talking about guilt and just, maybe I'm giving it different no. words, different <laughs> language. No, what you're saying is, no, no, no. What you're saying is absolutely perfect. Like, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I really do. I understand what you're saying. And I wish, like, as you're talking about it, I'm like, God. I'm like, I can't wait till I get to that point where, like, I not detach myself, but where I can finally say it's like I had nothing to do with why I survived and such and such didn't. Like, I didn't have a hand to play in that, you know. Um, but... I can't wait to get to the point to where you're at. May Honestly and truly. May I ask where you are now with it? Oh, I have lots of guilt. Like, I feel awful. And granted, mind you, I was just stage three. Like, a lot of these patients that we have, like, 
have fought stage four for a long time, like have re, like have had metastatic disease show up from stage three or two and have passed from it. But like, um, I, I know that I don't have stage four, but the fact that somebody else passed, you know, um, from it, I think that's what kills me because it could have been me in a way. Um, and it isn't. So that's just why I'm asking. It's just, I love asking people how they process loss and things like that, because I know that one day somebody's going to have this like answer that I'm going to be like, Oh my God, that makes sense. I need to start being a little bit more. Hmm. Like that. For me. <laughs> and <laughs> this is, uh, just part of my spiritual point of view. I'm always really mindful of how I say it because I'm not speaking about anybody else, but like what I have found in my experience in my life is that I've been provided like a brilliant curriculum designed for me. All this life has provided me is exactly what I've needed. Yeah. And yeah. And I listen to some things, I ignore other things. And it's like with life, like when we ignore things, then we just like kind of in that regard, we just stay on the rotary and we keep going around and around and around until we're finally going to notice it. You know what I mean? It's like when we're driving, yeah. going down the road of life. And it's like when I'm ready to look at it, there it is. And I believe I've been provided this experience. I never, after one month, I was like, I have not been stricken with cancer, the first diagnosis. Like, I was provided this experience. And mm -hmm. I may die and I may live, but that's irrelevant. I'm going to be grateful for my life while I have it now. Living and dying doesn't even matter. Like, this, is, this, oh, this diagnosis woke me up. Like, mm -hmm. you can experience your life. Like I said earlier, is it going to be a dress rehearsal? Then I got diagnosed a second yeah. time. Like I said, my wife left. I lost my job, moved out of the house, got diagnosed all in 10 months. I, I nicknamed myself Job on Facebook. Job. I was like, <laughs> where are the locusts? Like, this is insane. <laughs> and it broke my heart. But I, kn yeah. I knew that the devastation and heartbreak was also being provided for me. And it doesn't yeah. mean that it's any less real. But I recognize, like, I wasn't being stricken with this. I was being provided it. But I was like, whatever you're providing me, I can't keep up. I don't have the bandwidth for what you're providing. So, you know, I'm, some of the most difficult experiences, you know, losing people that are important to me, people that I love yeah. over the years. I don't understand the design. I can't say why anybody lives, anybody dies. All I can say is that every experience this life has provided me has been so perfect. Yeah. And, and the learning and teaching opportunities that unfortunately come through that experience, I think, are invaluable um, in regards to like what you choose to take away from that. Yeah, I just want to chime in like, for one yeah. sec. Like, my, here's why I, I get so careful about my speaking. Like, imagine someone who lost a child. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, like, I, 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 I'm not saying to them what I just said about me. Right. Like, I'm a moron. I don't know about what the hell this life is for and, and why it's, all I'm saying is for me, my experience, mm -hmm. you know, my unique experience has m profoundly, you know, been perfect for me i don't dare mm -hmm. try to suggest that anyone's experience anyone else's loss anyone else's terrible tragedies like should have been i i would never want anyone to think that's what i was saying all i can speak yeah, from no, is my uh, own experience and it's been a yeah. blessing to me yeah thank you for letting and me i think i no absolutely and i think i told you this when we first met because you're like you know this and this and my experience and blah 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 and i'm like there's no greater resource that you can provide like any random Joe Blow that will be anything greater. Like our experience is the greatest resource that we can provide a newly diagnosed patient or anybody along 
the, uh, this crazy walk that we call our journey or our fight or whatever you want to call it. And what I mean by that is that our diagnosis doesn't come with a manual. You literally wing it from the time that you hear those words that you have cancer. And what we make of our time as a cancer patient and what we choose to learn and take away from it definitely can be a pivoting point for somebody else that we meet along the way. You know, like just from you and I talking to each other, um, like about a month or so ago, you know, it's just like, I definitely know exactly how you feel, you know, like I know exactly what you mean by that. And just having somebody that understands the craziness that helps you feel a little bit less crazy and more like a champion that day. Mm. That, I mean, I think that's just incredible, but I do understand what you mean by that. Um, it literally, and I think that's where people get lost along the way is that the comparison into like what is meant, like what you mean for your personal experience is definitely not what somebody else might think or experience or, um, interpret. I just, I literally, I love your answer. Truly. I think it's wonderful. I'm going to get there one day. I promise. And I'll call you and tell you all about it. <laughs> you know, or you get where you get, you know? What do I know? <laughs> it's, uh, I, uh, yeah. I've had conversations with survivors who said, like, dude, I'm not where you are. I'm pissed off about this. I'm like, well, be pissed off. Mm -hmm. Feel free. Like, if you're, like, what I, I'm not big on advice, you know, I don't, but what I don't recommend if someone's asking, even if they do ask, I probably won't give them advice. But what I don't recommend is putting your feelings aside. Like, if you're pissed off and other people aren't, who cares? Be pissed off you have cancer. Be pissed off yeah. as all hell. Really get in it. Feel it. Feel it in your body. Like, what are you pissed off about? Like, like there's, you know, and, 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 because what we resist, you know, is that saying, you know, what we resist persists because it does. Mm -hmm. What you push away and try not to deal with is just going to be like, oh, now you got a thorn in your side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. It's been mm -hmm. really wonderful speaking with you. We're at like, we're almost three mm. hours. Oh, wow. Hmm. And I guess I have to go to work now. Pardon? I'm like, I guess I have to go to work now. I was going to say, Boo. we clearly ha could have more. I would love to. I have a meeting at 1.30, but I'll be done by 3.30. I can talk to you after. <laughs> we can do the second episode? Yeah, we can do the second episode. No, I think this might be two yeah. episodes, actually. Awesome. Yeah, but... Oh, my goodness. Oh, Marielle, you're wonderful. Awesome. I hope that I did not disappoint with my blabbing. Your blabbing gave people so much valuable insight. I hope... It's perfect. I hope, I've you know. just had the best time speaking with you. Just like. I have too, and I'm glad I got to see your face. I know, I know. Because we were talking on the phone that one time. I've been like so looking forward. <laughs> we had such a joy filled conversation about all the horrible things about I cancer know. that it's like I cannot wait to see your face. I know. Sorry that my hair is short now. You're sorry? I'll send you pictures when I finish growing it out. I'm like, I'm going to send him pictures. And straight up just be like, hey, I don't have hair anymore. <laughs> no, you look <laughs> great. What are you talking about? What a what a wonderful haircut. Especially but, when it's so hot outside. Oh, my God. And in Charleston, it's just awful. Like, I was going through my pictures, and I'm like, shit. I have a lot of pictures of my kids. I'm like, I don't have any pictures of me. Like, I'm like, what is happening? And then I'm like, oh, because I don't walk around taking pictures of myself. Right. So, I asked for, like, what, at least three pictures of people. And you sent me that one, I like, know. a moment after I asked you. And I'm like... Is this just how you roll? Like you got like, your lipstick on, you're looking great and everything. You got this. I'm like, this is just Marielle every day, apparently. I wish. I wish. Like when I do have long hair, yes, because I hate wearing my hair up. So I have like my hair fixed in some way. My what my wife, my boss, which literally is my wife, she's like, You have the best hair and you always look put together. I'm like, I have to look put together because Michael, our CEO, will throw me like in some random video call. And I can't be wearing, like, a baseball hat and, like, a hoodie. <laughs> I'm like, hey. <laughs> like, especially being, like, over the buddy program now, I, um, I'm i lucky, like, I get to deal with, like, a lot of VIP people. 
Um, so I'm like constantly on phone calls and like on video. So I have to kind of sort of be presentable. So I'm like, I'll just cut all my hair off. I have to like look put together somehow. Oh. So I'm like short hairs. So like right now, but no, it's like, it's really hot and I'm just, I was in one of those moods. At least I didn't cut my hair by myself or give myself bangs or anything like that. Nope. I didn't do anything crazy. Yeah. When I um, had super long hair, like I told you, when I cut it, the relief, part of the relief was because I had super curly locks. And if I didn't mm -hmm. take care of them, it was frizzy and looked horrible. It's so like when my hair was down, <laughs> I had to do the work to make it look good because I it yeah. would not be frizzy. I'm like, if I'm going to go out, it's going to look good. And so I'm with you. You're like, uh, if I'm going to get thrown on a call, that means I have to regularly take care of my hair. No, thank you. I'll cut it off. And now I'm good. Now the boss can be, yeah, I need you on a call in 10 minutes. You're like, you're not, yeah. your first thought isn't, what am I going to do about my hair? <laughs> right. So yesterday I show up, I literally had like two crazy little pigtails. Speaking of Michael, he's like, you want to talk at 1.30? I'm like, yeah. I had like two crazy pigtails, this frizzy hair because I went running in the morning. And we had like our staff meeting just for like my team. And... <laughs> My VP happens to pop on and I'm like, fantastic. I am like looking a hot mess express over here. And then some new hire shows up and pops up on the video. And I am like, what is happening? I'm like, who didn't tell me like all these people were going to be on our call? I'm like, I would have taken the effort at least put on a baseball hat. I'm like, what <laughs> is this? My boss is like, you, she's like, your face right now. I was like, if I could kill you over the phone right now, I'm like, I so would. I'm like, what are you telling me? I'm like, we were just talking like five minutes before this meeting. Like, <laughs> Now, do you have a call in three minutes, you're saying? Yeah, with Michael. He'll be fine. So you got to jump. It's been an absolute yeah. pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye, Bert. Thanks for having me on your show. I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you so much for tuning in. I truly hope this podcast was of value to you. Please subscribe and let your friends and family know they can find But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast, anywhere podcasts are made available. To learn more about my cancer survivorship coaching, please go to BertScholl.com. That's B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-L-L.com. If you'd like to support But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast, please go to our Patreon page at Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast. And thank you so much for all you do. See you all in the next episode, and thank you so much for listening. The intro and outro music you hear is the creation of Saint Kid. You can find him on social media as The Saint Kid. The purpose of this podcast is to provide a platform for individuals to discuss personal experiences with a medical diagnosis. The host and guests are not medical professionals, and the podcast is not intended to provide medical advice or psychological therapy. Whenever there is a concern about mental or physical health, please consult a qualified medical professional.